Episode 286, Power Inflation, 4. Belial. The Worthless One. 6 o'clock. The sixth of the ten demons who descended to destroy humanity. An ambitious man who joined forces with Dantalian, the old city, to devour Quo Vadis and the bourgeoisie at the same time. Finally, the guy showed his true colors. The most beautiful being among those cast out from heaven. They decorate the outside with extravagant decorations and flashy wealth, but in reality, the appearance behind it is extremely ugly. Goat horns on the head of a huge pig, sharp teeth like swords under the exposed gums without lips. Lightning coming out of the eyes, eye glow coming out like smoke from a beacon, and breath filled with a disgusting stench. Its mouth was wide open like a crevasse on an arctic ice wall, and the horns and wings extending out on both sides were large enough to cover the entire battlefield. This gigantic and hideous figure floating like a hazy mist over the body of Bartholomew, who is no better than a puppet, is the true body of Belial. Crunch. Vikir lifted up the magic sword Beelzebub. I'm glad I met him before he formed an army. Deception, disturbance, incitement, estrangement, etc. Belial's specialty is especially valuable in large-scale battles. So, the best way to hunt him is to engage in one colon one combat. Meanwhile, Decoravia continued to give advice to Vakir's chest. It's been a while since I've seen you, that guy. The name, Belial, means, worthless, in the dead language of an old magic suzerain that is now extinct. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. The baby madam was also clinging to Vakir's shoulder with her entire body for standing upright. Judging from the way his crooked eyebrows are raised upward, he seems to regard his master's enemy as his own enemy. Saint. Come here. Vakir placed Dolores behind him. Dolores moved cautiously and approached Vakir. At that time, Belial's mouth opened. The guy was looking straight at Dolores. When the priests renounced God and turned into a group of blasphemers, no one was worshipped as often as this body in temples and altars. A tone full of ridicule. As he said, Belial has already encroached on nearly half of the religious hymns Quo Vadis. Humbert. Dolores gritted her teeth. Did Cardinal Humbert of Quo Vadis know that Bartholomew was Belial? Even though he knew that, did he conspire with him and make the family sick? Dolores shuddered as she remembered her adoptive father's displeased look. Humbert was clearly human, but to her, he was more fearful than the devil. Right then. There is nothing to be afraid of. A voice with a calm tone was heard. Where Dolores turned her head, the night hound was standing reassuringly. For a moment, Dolores recalled the time before Dantalian. That's right. It was like that back then too. When Dantalian turned over the strange sack and pulled out the illusion of Humbert inside it, Dolores lost the strength to endure for a moment due to the suffocating fear and burden. And. There is nothing to be afraid of. Even then, with a word of encouragement from the night hound, Dolores was able to shake off all her fears and gain peace of mind. Thank you, night hound. Dolores prayed and stood close behind Vakir. While Belial drew up his demonic power and prepared to attack, Dolores also memorized a prayer. Lord Loon is a strong city, a shield and weapons, he will save us from great trouble. Pot. White light erupted like flames and enveloped Vakir. Although the flame burned with fierce force, it did not feel hot to Vakir at all. The old enemy, the devil, is using his strength even at this time, using plots and authority as his weapons. Who in the world can stand against him? If I rely only on my own strength, I have no choice but to be defeated. A powerful general comes out and fights on my behalf. Who is this general? That holy name. At that moment, Dolores, who had been reciting a prayer, stopped. Then, after some hesitation, he continued praying. Hound of the Night. Rune Pilgrim. Lord of Hosts. Who will suffer? I will definitely win. After finishing her prayer, Dolores placed her hands on Vakir's back with both trembling hands. And he spoke in a voice that trembled even more than his hands. Well, I think I'll get better buffs if I know the real name of the night hound over there. There is power in names. 
Just by being called, it affects causality and generates strange energy that crosses the negative and positive dimensions. Therefore, demons do not reveal their true names carelessly. The same goes for demon hunters who hunt such demons. This is enough. But Vikir cut off Dolores. Part of it was to prevent him from becoming more deeply entangled with her by telling her her name, but in fact, another reason was bigger. Quack 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 quack. Belial began to attack in earnest. Belial's body, located somewhere between the intangible and the tangible, was clearly giving both a spiritual and a material shock at the same time. How dare an insignificant human being! Belial spits out arrogant lines like the devil usually does. However, Bakir is an experienced hunter who has caught four demon kings so far. It's going to be a little shaky. Bakir spoke to Dolores, who placed her hand on her back. Before Dolores could say anything. Flash! Bakir's sword began to emit a dark red aura. The high-speed rotating aura created seven large teeth and an eighth slightly smaller tooth. The teeth moved furiously, rotating like a cartwheel, and flew towards Belial's body and became embedded. Qua 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 Baskerville's eighth style. A slash that instantly turned the body of Bartolomeo, one of the strongest men in the human world, into a rag. It contained such power that even Belial, who appeared in its original form, could not dare to downplay it. Pfft! How can a human have this kind of power? Belial stepped back in an embarrassed tone. Bikir never missed this opportunity, which was almost forced upon him. If there is no gap, twist it open with force. Eight teeth were ruthlessly ripping all over Belial's body. Moreover, the buff that Dolores used with all her might made Bikir's eighth tooth grow even larger. Wow! Belial's teeth and horn were broken. Even the armor that looked gorgeous and heavy cracked and crumbled into pieces. Above all, it seemed like Bartholomew's body couldn't hold on. My eight senses are not complete. We have to win the game within a short period of time. Bikir gritted his teeth and moved forward. In my mind, Hugo's slash that slaughtered Andromalius and Cain Corso's slash that shook the entire tomb were overlapping. And from behind, the power of Dolores' buff is rushing in like a flood. Flash! Vikir ignored the burden on his body and brought Beelzebub down to the end. Kuthump! A heavy seismic wave rises, collapsing the mountains of gold around it. Ugh crumble! Belial staggered back, with every part of his body destroyed. Vikir received the healing spell cast by Dolores and raised his sword once again. At that time, Dolores spoke regretfully. The buff isn't as good as it was in the Dantalian battle. She seemed to be feeling deep self-destruction at her lack of strength. That's because the power of the buff has become incomparably weaker than when hunting Dantalian at the orphanage. I've put in a lot of effort so far, in fact, I think it has regressed. But Vikir thought it was natural. Awakening doesn't happen that easily. The divine power shown by Dolores during the Dantalian War was truly a miracle, advancing the understanding of her divine power by decades. I didn't know the exact cause and conditions of awakening, but there is no way to develop if you rely on such luck in the first place. Bikir continued to swing his sword and began to put pressure on Belial. Right then. Hu hu hu. Indeed. Killing my colleagues wasn't just luck. Belial stood up. Surprisingly, while our eyes were apart for a moment, the guy had recovered from most of his wounds and damage. Vikir swung the slash once again. So 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 so. It carved a deep scar into Belial's chest once again. Ho 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 no use. Human. You lowly worm. But Belial was not intimidated at all. Soon, he stretched out his two large hands to both sides. Soon after, unpleasant events began to occur. Jangle jangle, jangle jangle, jangle jangle, jangle. Loud metallic sounds were heard from everywhere. When Dolores turns her head in surprise, she sees a golden water stream flowing. Char. The sound of money moving. Countless gold coins were crawling like giant snakes, creating ripples on the floor. The gold coins, jewels, and various treasures that came in this way were absorbed into Belial's body. Crump. Pop. 
Quasizig. Belial's broken horn grew again and his cracked body recovered to its original state. Moreover, the originally huge size was swelling even bigger. All the wealth in this safe is my life force. Money is power. Money is life. In a world dominated by mammonism, wealth is vitality. Dolores was astonished at those words. An enormous amount of wealth piled up in this vast vault. Belial's plan to store all of these as extra vitality was truly meticulous and thorough. Only then did Dolores understand why Belial always dragged outsiders into the vault. It was not for the simple reason of discouraging the visitors. Because this is his home ground where he can exercise absolute authority, power, and vitality. But. I already knew that. Vikir frowned at Belial with a calm tone. Crunch. The magic sword Beelzebub has become a little longer. A dark red aura began to burn brightly again under the hem of the black coat. Eventually, the light from the red eyes condenses on the black mask and glows dimly. If money is your life. A boiling voice cut through the sharp teeth of a hunting dog. I'll make you completely bankrupt. It was a declaration of war against the ruler of the vast Golden Township. Episode 287, Power Inflation, 5. Gahahaha. <laughs> Belial laughed with his mouth open so wide that his lower jaw sank to his chest. It was a sculpture so large that the surrounding Golden Mountains collapsed. Bankruptcy. Is that really what I'm saying with my wealth right in front of my eyes? Countless piles of gold coins, jewels, and various valuable treasures are forming mountain ranges beyond the mountains. Every time Belial gets hurt, he absorbs the treasures and recovers his strength. Treasures fill nearly half of the vast vault. As long as this enormous wealth exists, Belial's life will last forever. Decarabia, who was on Vakir's chest, blinked his single eye and said. Belial is an infinitely weak demon when he has no money, but he is infinitely powerful when he has a lot of money. Well, isn't this something that's so strange to humans? In human society, there is a saying that goes, money can control ghosts. A similar logic applies in the demon world. It's a troublesome ability. It's not a bother. As I said before. Decarabia began introducing Belial's powers one by one. Belial's main powers are jealousy, destruction, oppression, exile, famine, commotion, and desolation. Jealousy, which disturbs the enemy's vision with the dark energy emitted from the body, destruction, which replaces gold power with muscular strength and unleashes it with fists, and exile, which blocks the movement of enemies with a whirlpool of gold coins and keeps them far away from each other. Famine, which devours the other person's money by spraying water, unrest, which spews out powerful waves from its mouth, and desolation, which devastates the surrounding area with its huge size. Cool. Vikir had to retreat again and again to avoid the power of destruction swirling everywhere. At that time. Whisper. Dolores hugged Vikir tightly. Vikir looked back and tried to say something, but Dolores shouted faster. Avoid, hound of the night. Dolores also fell on top of Vikir, who fell to the floor. At the same time. Quack 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 quack. Ujijik. Belial's fist narrowly missed, smashing the gold coin hill on the other side and collapsing it. At that time. Aya. Dolores, who was attacked by Belial, began to scream. Destruction was avoided, but famine could not be avoided. Tsutsutsutsu. Everything made of gold, including buttons, pins, and gold thread, attached to her luxurious nun's clothes turned into crumbs and were sucked into Belial's body. Belial's ability to famine is to rob and absorb all the wealth of others and use it as his own power. It dries up all of the other person's wealth, no matter how much they have. Eventually, the buttons, pins, and gold thread disappeared, and the clothes lost their shape and fell apart. Dolores was astonished. The nun's clothes, which had not been exposed at all, were torn in several places, exposing her bare skin. Bah, the night hound is watching. My face and earlobes became extremely red. But Dolores' suffering did not end there. Lice will boil in your body and in your barn. Belial's power of famine does not simply take away the other person's wealth. 
Isn't there a saying that health is the most valuable thing in that the body is an asset? It has the ability to eat away at the other person's wealth, but it goes further than that and even eats away at the body in blood. That is the true identity of the foul power that Belial wields. Busily, bustling. Soon, they started crawling on Dolores' body. These white bloodsuckers burrow into every part of Dolores' soft, white skin and suck out blood with their sharp teeth. Ugh, wow! Dolores couldn't help but scratch all over her body with her hands without realizing it. A tearful expression. The sight of Dolores desperately holding on to her flowing clothes with one hand and scratching various parts of her body with the other made Vakir think of this, even if only for a moment. It's bizarre. Dolores shouted as Vakir remained speechless for a moment. Well, I feel wronged. I obviously bathe and shower every day, but why do I have teeth? I'll understand first. Now, wait. Just for now. Just for now. Vikir neatly ignored Dolores' excuses, which she cried out in embarrassment and resentment. Since he ended up like that while trying to protect himself from Belial's attack, of course we should help him. You go and help. Vikir asked his friend on his shoulder. Hap. Baby madam. The guy bent his crooked eyebrows and made a salute pose. This trusty guy quickly bounced across the floor and clung to Dolores' back. And. Kuo. It began to exude its pride as an absolute leader standing at the pinnacle of the insect ecosystem. Shivering. Spider. Natural enemy. In front of that fearsome peer, they began to tremble and escape from Dolores' body. Even though it was in front of Belial, the orders of the madam race were absolute. This is true only in the insect world. The octagonal madam was a monster that could outweat even high-ranking demons of the demon king level. Vikir nodded. Although Madam Baby is young, she clearly has the qualities of a monster king. If raised well, it will be a great help in the fight against demons in the future. Meanwhile. Bang. Quack. Usajajijik. Belial was running wild, squandering his enormous financial resources and strength. Gahaha. Not guilty by crime, not guilty by crime. Who can stand against this infinite power of money? The vast vault is full of riches. Belial shouted as if he was drunk, looking at the golden horizon that formed the mountain range. You've collected a lot. When this safe is full, I'll be able to open the gate by myself. There is no need for sloppy colleagues. Belial did not hesitate to blaspheme the other Sasangsi. He was extremely self righteous and just as strong. Money. To be exact, value for money. To be more precise, human greed for money. Money is important because it has value, and what makes it valuable is because of human greed. As long as greed abounds in the human world, Belial's power is also infinite and its growth potential is endless. How much wealth and how much greed has Belial accumulated while the bourgeoisie was wearing the guise of a matriarch? Die, bugs. Belial succeeded in forcing Vakir into the corner of the safe and immediately swung his huge fist. Bung. A sight as if a meteorite was falling. But the only difference is that the tail is burning black rather than red. Right then. This land is infested with devils and is trying to devour us. Dolores once again blocked Vakir's path. Stand without fear, you will win with the truth. Even if relatives, wealth, honor, and life are all taken away, the truth will live and the kingdom will last forever. Rune. White flames erupted and created a wall. Grumble. Wow. The firewall of sacred fire immediately knocked Belial's fist back upon contact. Cheekeek. Soon, the ultra-high temperature burning white light began to burn Belial's fist. Ugh. Belial, who had been pushing hard, retreated, albeit slightly. Belial's power was neutralized in front of that pure flame that was not devoid of even the slightest hint of greed. However. Belial put his fist back and immediately began to play with his cunning tongue. Saint. What did I say? You said money isn't a bad thing, right? At that moment, the words Belial had said through Bartolomeo's mouth flashed in Dolores' mind. 
In fact, wealth is a colorless, odorless, and tasteless being. It has no form, no taste, and no scent. It's extremely value neutral. If you use it well, it is good, and if you use it badly, it is bad. It's like fire can burn a mountain, but it can also save the little match girl who is dying in a winter alley. At the same time, Belio smiled, twisting his torn mouth even more hideously. That's right. Money is neither righteous nor unclean. It is value neutral. After speaking, Belial opened his two huge fists and placed his palms on the floor. Whoop! GG Geek! Soon, Belial grabbed a huge amount of gold coins in his hands. So your shield that blocks evil things won't be useless. Dolores broke into a cold sweat in front of Belial's huge hand rising high. Yet! Hachachachachachang! A huge amount of gold coins began to fly in. Each piece of money contains enough destructive power to pierce several people. They tear apart the saints' defenses so easily and burrow deep inside. This. The wall of flame has low physical defense. Dolores took a step back, dumbfounded. However, it was impossible to escape the shower of gold coins raining down on the vast area. Yet. Quack 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 quack. The whole surrounding area was devastated. The Gumwa Hills collapsed and the terrain changed drastically. The smoke of gold dust fluttering in the air. However. Hmm. Belial could not achieve what he wanted. Vikir stands tall, holding Dolores, whose legs are weak, with a mesmerized expression. And floating in front of Vikir is a translucent red inverted pentagram shield. Wailing Wall. It's been a while, Belial. At number 7, Decorabia was flashing his single eye. Episode 288, Power Inflation, 6. A shower of gold coins raining down over a wide area. Quack 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 quack. It was such a terrifying destructive force that it completely distorted the surrounding terrain. But. Vikir walked away from the billowing smoke of gold dust and stood without notice. Wailing Wall. Seventh Hour Decorabia. The Devil's Shield, which was once an insurmountable wall for mankind, was now on the side of humans and protecting Bakir. It's been a while, Belial. Belial's eyes widened at Decorabia's delicate voice. What kind of situation is this, Decorabia? Why are you coming out there now? I come out when I want to come out and where I want to come out. That's not what you're saying. What about the great mission of opening the gate and what are you doing here? Didn't you say something with your own mouth just now? I don't need any colleagues. How about trying to open the gate on your own? Belial gritted his teeth in bewilderment at Decorabia's dry voice. You've collected a lot. When this safe is full, I'll be able to open the gate by myself. There is no need for sloppy colleagues. There was something he had just said. Belial suppressed his anger and opened his mouth in a somewhat calm voice. Decoravia. Betrayal like this will never benefit you. Betrayal? That expression is wrong, little one. I was never on anyone's side. Then are you confident that you can handle the anger of your compatriots? Can you completely accept with your body the anger of the one who is, one and everything, who is, all and one? The answer will be kept secret forever by the covenant. Belial and Decoravia's Zen questions ended here. It seems that Decoravia has decided not to answer Belial's questions anymore. Vikir spoke briefly. Belial is not only the devil of commerce, but he is also the devil of speech. The two are inseparable. So the answer is not to mix words for a long time. I know how cunning his tongue is, human. More than that, how do you feel about using me? Isn't it amazing? Vikir looked at Decoravia's self-praise for a moment. The translucent shield emits a faint red light as if showing off its appearance. Although mana consumption was severe, the only ability to block physical damage was the incredibly powerful shield. Moreover, since the size and hardness can also be adjusted, it seemed like it could be used efficiently if mana control could be controlled in detail. It's worth using. How is it worth using? Is that all you feel? Decorabia, who was grumbling dissatisfied, glanced at Dolores behind him. Well, it doesn't matter, 
because being able to protect a beautiful woman is a good thing. Of course, the same goes for handsome men. But more than anything, the person worth protecting is a handsome man dressed as a beautiful woman, or a beautiful woman dressed as a handsome man. This body that loves good and evil and all chaos. Shut up. Here we come again. Bikir raised his decoravia and prepared for the attack in front of him. Sure enough, Belial threw down the gold coins that were filled with both hands and poured down a huge golden bombardment. Tukong dang 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 jng. Sparks and loud noises shake the shield of the inverted pentagram. However, Decoravia's shield, which demonstrated almost unrivaled power in physical defense, did not even flinch. It's good, but it consumes too much mana. The loud vibration of the mana hole at the bottom makes me feel extremely seasick. It seemed like it would be necessary to accumulate a significant amount of mana before shielding in order to build up Decoravia's proficiency. At that time. Uh, over there, you can get off now. Dolores covered her face and whispered in a low voice. The ears that were visible through the hair were so red that they could no longer be hot. Bikir quietly lowered her from his belt to the floor. And he said something. There is no need to try too hard alone. Because I'm a colleague. Dolores' eyes opened wide at those words. The night hound called him a companion. And the moment you hear those words. Exciting. My heart started beating loudly. Why, why is my heart like this? There's something hot inside. Dolores pressed her left breast with her hand. An unprecedented power stirs within. An unidentifiable warm energy started from the left chest and spread throughout the body. Is this also the soul-made effect? It seems similar to the feelings I felt before in the Dantalian match. I couldn't make a detailed comparison right now because I was in such a hurry. At that time. Die. You bastards. Belial scattered gold coins again. A shower of metal flew in like a barrage of bullets, and this time, a black wave cannon was added that spewed out from Belial's mouth. Cool. A storm of gold and darkness sweeps all around. This. Waves are difficult. Decoravia blocked the shower of gold coins without difficulty, but seemed to be burdened by Belial's magic attack that followed. At that time. Do not worry. Dolores boldly stepped forward once again. Fa. The wall of the torch, which was much larger and thicker than before, blocked Belial's wave cannon. Belial's magic energy is broken down and scattered by divine power. However, Belial did not retreat easily this time either. Just a spark in front of a strong wind. It's just a trivial energy. As the gold coins in the safe were absorbed into Belial's gigantic body, the demonic energy it was emitting was becoming more and more intense. Ugh. Such a powerful devil. How? Dolores gritted her teeth as she felt the sacred shield being pushed back. Meanwhile, Bakir was measuring the distance of the sword strike and looking for a gap behind Dolores' shield. Even just this amount is a big help. Thanks. Dolores felt a little more energized after hearing what the night hound said. But compared to the Dantalian battle, it's a world of difference. Dolores wanted to be of some help to the night hounds in some way. I wanted to share the burden he was carrying. I wish he had relied on me a little more. I wanted to receive his expectations and become someone he could rely on. The name and the color are soul mates. Dolores eventually stopped hesitating and turned her head. Night Hound. When Vikir turned his head, Dolores shouted, trying to look as confident as possible. Please tell me your name. What? As Vikir tilted his head, Dolores whined. As you can see, it's getting harder and harder to hold up the defenses. She's right. Even Dolores' divine power, which seemed to be overflowing with innate talent and blessings, was now slowly running out. In order to increase divine power, we need that resonance phenomenon. Dolores was referring to the soul mate phenomenon. If I could empathize more deeply with the night hound, if our bond could become even stronger, there would definitely be a change. They are soul mates in name and appearance, but they don't even know the other person's name. Dolores once again thought this was very unreasonable. It's okay if it's not your full name. 
Even the smallest nickname I can call you, could you please tell me at least one word of your name? Dolores asked, looking at me even in a difficult situation. A slender girl blocking the enormous power of the devil. How long can those thin and delicate forearms hold out? Bakir decided that now was not the time to hesitate. And as soon as he made his decision, he took a long step forward and headed towards Dolores. Soon, the night hound lowers its head towards Dolores' ear, which is supporting the defensive wall. Half. A name that catches your attention. And hot breath. Dolores trembled for a moment. It was called, Ban, Dot. Dolores felt her heart beating faster. Tong Siang Miang. The process of getting to know each other by going through each other's names. The name truly contains a mysterious power. Even though I only heard a short snippet of his name, I felt as if the emotional and psychological distance from the night hound had become significantly closer. Perhaps I may be the only person in the world who knows his name. As Dolores' heart began to beat violently, something strange happened. Thump thump thump. The sacred flame blooming with divine power became hotter and more intense. Fa. Gurgling. The unprecedented emotions that had been fluttering in my chest earlier were shaking even more strongly. The heart beats, the divine power pulsates in time with the beat, the white flames flutter vividly. It was the moment when my soulmate awakened once again. Ya -ap. Dolores spewed out the flame with all her might and completely pushed back the wave cannon that Belial spewed out. What? As his attack shatters and scatters, ultra-high temperature white heat rushes in and burns the inside of his mouth. Belial could not help but be horrified. Okay, that's it. That's okay. Dolores looked down at her hands and shouted. A phenomenon that cannot be performed or explained to anyone else. Only the night hound know, it's a miracle that only happens when you're with Ban. Bakir wanted to congratulate Dolores on once again creating a miracle as the Iron Saint, but unfortunately there was not enough time. Gap. Baskerville Type 8. Bunchen's teeth. Eight slashes tearing through the air fly towards Belial. Quack 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 quack. A loud bang erupted, accompanied by a terrible scream. It was a cruel death uttered by the devil. But. Char. The gold coin started moving quickly again. A golden snake crawling through the billowing smoke. Belial, who absorbed countless treasures, soon cast his healthy body to the ground. It was quite hot. However, it is still just a useless resistance. Belial had a sneer on his lips as if he had never cried out in pain. This is a war of attrition that is disadvantageous. Dolores said, blowing out flames from both hands. Vikir also agreed with this. You just have to hold on a little longer. Time is on our side. Dolores tilts her head at Vikir's words. She was still unaware of the intentions of the night hound, who was saying the exact opposite while becoming more disadvantageous as time passed. Right then. An unexpected good news occurred. Quack quack quack. Puff. Belial, who was sucking up the gold coins, fell back due to a sudden explosion. Hmm. What is this? The gold coins that were sweeping furiously toward Belial stopped. Suddenly, large golden walls rose up and blocked the flow of funds. At the same time, a large golden fist rose up from the floor and struck Belial on the head. Bang! Belial had to be pushed back once again, spitting out his broken teeth. W what is it? Who? Dolores turned her head with wide eyes. The same was true for Vakir. An unexpected person who suddenly entered the battlefield and attacked Belial. Underneath the messy white hair, the face that looks as innocent as a puppy can be seen gradually changing into a complex expression due to various emotions. Fear. Confusion. Astonishment. Shock. Anger. Sinclair. She stood at the center of all these emotions. Episode 289, Power Inflation, 7. W what is this? Dream? Sinclair looked around with trembling eyes. Bartholomew with his eyes open and a huge devil floating above him. The devil's opponent is the Hound of the Night and Saint Dolores, holding hands. 
Sinclair just kept blinking as if he couldn't believe the current situation. Dolores was very embarrassed. Why is Sinclair here? You must have drank tea with sleeping pills in it. She asked, trying to remain calm. Sinclair. Are you okay? Looking at his condition, it looks like he was taken by sleeping pills. It's okay, it's okay. Hmm, since I often take various types of sleeping pills, my tolerance has become stronger. Sinclair usually has a very tight schedule, including part-time work, school work, personal study, and extracurricular activities. This happened because I was under a lot of stress and didn't know that I was taking various types of sleeping pills and my tolerance for them had become very strong. However, even so, the efficacy of sleeping pills cannot be ignored. Sinclair's eyes were still slightly open, as if he was half asleep. I was so sleepy that I stumbled and fell on an open box, and I guess the door had closed before that. But what kind of situation is this? Um, what is that again? Plus, the night hounds. She asked, looking back and forth between Belial and Bakir. Dolores gritted her teeth. It's Sinclair. I'll explain everything later. For now, come this way. But she couldn't finish her sentence. Belio laughed and raised his huge fist. It wouldn't be a bad idea to weed out useless relationships at this point. As of this time, all plays have ended. Bartholomew's body was broken once more and his terrifying magical energy exploded. And Sinclair's eyes narrowed when he saw that. Quack 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 quack. Yet. Belial's fist landed where Sinclair was. Dolores cried out in shock as she saw Belial's attack falling like a meteorite. See, Sinclair. No. She ran while maximizing her divine power, but it was not enough to keep up with the speed. But. Dolores was immediately surprised. Crack. Yuduk. Pudaduk. Sinclair blocked Belial's fist. Huge golden palms protruding from the floor and walls were blocking Belial's fists. What is this? Belial frowned at the unexpected interruption. But it wasn't just a simple interruption. Pupupupup. Golden thorns sprouted out of nowhere from the back of the golden hand and pierced Belial's fist. When Belial hurriedly withdrew his hand, changes around him began to appear. Char. Wave of gold coins. Treasures piled up in various places were flowing in this direction, creating waves. Not towards Belial, but towards Sinclair. Clang clack clack. Squeak. 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 The golden snakes were being sucked towards the hat that Sinclair was holding in his hand. And as a result, the mana that Sinclair gave off was also becoming more and more powerful. I have a lot of money. This is the prize Sinclair received after finishing 8th in the college league. Hee hee, it's a world where money is power. I really need to make a lot of money to wear this hat. A hat that makes your magic stronger when you spend money on it. Although it was worn here and there and the brim had teeth missing, one effect was definitely an artifact. Gurgling. Sinclair, wearing a hat, cast magic once again. The gold coins and bars around seemed to have melted due to the flames, but then came together to form a huge fist. Bang! Belial's head turns again. What an annoying guy. Belial's pupils, which were as wide as those of a mountain goat, were young. Crack! Bartolomeo's body moved. The bombong in his hand drew a strange trajectory and twisted like a snake with hundreds of joints. Ugh! Blood fountains burst out from all over the body. Sinclair stepped back to avoid Bartolomeo, who was swinging his sword in front of him. Matriarch. Why are you like this? Ugh. She cries out in confusion as if she recognizes Bartholomew's face. Dolores shouted when she saw that. Sinclair. That person is not the head of a bourgeois family. I'm just a puppet whose body was taken over by the devil a long time ago. Yes. Well, that can't be possible. A devil? Please believe me. But this time, Dolores couldn't finish her sentence. Pop. This is because Vakir, who flew in on Madame Baby's wire, soared upward with Sinclair around her waist. Quack. 
The area where Sinclair was standing just moments ago was horribly destroyed by Bartholomew Slash. Ha! Huh. Sinclair flinched when he saw the face of the person who had grabbed his body. Hounds of the Night. A strange person with a gloomy red glow flowing from the eyes of the mask. Hey, let go of this. Villain. She quickly raised her mana, but she had already used up too much power while creating and operating the large golden hand just a moment ago. Eating money makes you stronger, but there is a limit to the speed at which you can eat it. Vikir lowered the struggling Sinclair back to the floor. Ah. Uh. Sinclair looked blank for a moment as he landed politely, which was different from what he expected. Vikir spoke briefly, deliberately making his voice sound harsher. There is nothing good about being involved. If you get taken hostage for no reason, you'll be in trouble, so stay back. Hostage? You're in trouble. Sinclair looked confused. Eventually, she quickly calmed her breathing. The way his eyes suddenly become harsh is truly the attitude of a genius. They took me hostage, so why should you, the hound of the night, be in trouble? Do you know me? It doesn't mean that they are on the side of justice right now. Then why did you save me? Bait to divert attention. Who made Mr. Bartholomew like that? Is that you? What is your relationship with President Dolores? Sinclair's non-stop questions were calm and sharp, but there was a slight tremor at the end. It was like a blade held by an unprepared child. And the seasoned Vikir knew how to deal with such a fragile blade. The devil is absolute evil. You wouldn't be so stupid as to not know that, right? You're being treated like a child there doesn't seem to be much difference in age. An entity that stands against absolute evil is not necessarily good, but I believe that at least it will know which side to stand at the moment of decisive battle. What to see, what to believe, and what choices to make are entirely personal matters. It is, not entangled, in the first place. There is no need for persuasion or inspiration. All you have to do is just follow your own path. After finishing speaking, Bakir turned his head. And in front of him, a wide-eyed Bartolomeo was running towards him, holding the magic sword Bamang. Ugh. Vikir struck off Bartholomew's right hand with his sword. And it even left deep scars on the body of Belial beyond that. Ugh. But it's no use. Belial was in pain, but it was only for a short time, and his wounds were regenerated by absorbing the gold and silver treasures around him. Overflowing wealth, seething greed. As long as there is money and people want it, value is eternal. Belial eats money, value, and greed and enjoys life and power that are virtually infinite. But Vikir did not give up. Goes. I'll support you. Vikir lays down his sword to level it and Dolores grants protection from behind. Yet. Flash. With a dazzling light, eight teeth engulfed in white flame bite the whole world. Baskerville Type 8. Perfect state. It viciously chopped up Belial's entire body. Gahahaha. <laughs> it's no use. As long as the money in the safe doesn't dry up, I can recover as much as I want. Belial laughed loudly despite the wounds and pain that ravaged his whole body. Yet. Carol Aralalak. Gold coins are flocking in again, making a loud noise. Belial siphoned off a huge amount of money. How is it? The infinite and eternal power of this body. However. Uh. Belial couldn't stop laughing until the end. Obviously, like before, even though I absorbed a huge amount of wealth, my physical strength was not fully recovered. Yes. What is this? What's the matter? Belial looked down at the bundles of gold coins, bills, jewels, and money being sucked into his body. They were clearly accumulating in my body one by one, but strangely, the speed at which my physical strength recovered was becoming slower and slower. The volume and weight of the wealth are the same. However, the resulting recovery gradually decreased noticeably, and in the end, it became virtually ineffective. Belial was puzzled as he looked at the deep scars that were still deep all over his body. And then forward. It's finally time. Vikir took a step. Are you curious why your recovery has been slow? Vikir asked Belial, who looked embarrassed. Soon, Vikir took out a piece of paper from his pocket and flew it towards Belial. 
Belial's eyes widened as if torn apart. Emergency news suspicious currency distributed in downtown Wangdo, counterfeit currency. Or is it a sign of hyperinflation? Yesterday evening, a large amount of mysterious money was dispersed in the skies of the ecliptic. As the balloon burst, the unidentified gold coins and banknotes contained in the giant balloon poured down like a shower all over the empire, regardless of time and place. Citizens are anxious as they do not know whether this money is counterfeit currency or whether there is really a lot of money released into the market, and economic experts are concerned about a short-term loss of trust in fiat currency. It was an article in the morning newspaper scheduled to be published tomorrow morning. Episode 290, Power Inflation, 8. Inflation. Currency expansion. A phenomenon in which there is too much currency and its value falls. Balloons rose simultaneously in major central areas, including the imperial capital, the center of the empire. The large balloons went up into the sky at one o'clock one day and soon burst due to the difference in air pressure or other external factors. And the things inside the balloon poured down to the ground. It was money, such as banknotes, gold coins, etc. As a result of the enormous amount of money released into the imperial capital, citizens began to distrust money. Money? I don't accept it. Let's just barter. How do you know if this gold coin is real or fake? We will not be able to accept deposits for the time being. Oh, I liked it because I got a lot of money, but I wasn't going to like this. I guess we should use paper money as firewood and gold coins as weights. If this continues, won't the country be ruined? There was a phenomenon of hoarding of food, and no one was willing to exchange daily necessities for money. And there were two eyes watching this huge chaos. Is it okay for the director of the Currency Manufacturing Bureau to be like this? Green blonde beauty, Thindy Wendy. A middle-aged brown-haired man stands where she directs her curious gaze. Bourgeoisie Damien. He is the director of the Imperial Coinage Bureau. The two were looking at the money scattered throughout the imperial capital from a high tower. Huge amount of counterfeit currency. It is impossible to determine authenticity with the naked eye. It was a work that director Damien put a lot of effort into creating. The role of distributing and distributing the counterfeit currency throughout the empire was handled by the logistics master, Thindy Wendy. Damien spoke quietly. If you're going to dig a grave, you have to dig too. My brothers, and mine. Good posture. I guess you've been sharpening your knife for a long time. It's been a long time since I harbored a desire for revenge against my family. I never thought I could achieve that with someone else's hands. I can quite empathize with this because I am in a similar situation. Thindy Wendy and Damien. They both had something they wanted revenge on, so they joined hands with the Hound of the Night. We both joined hands with a scary man. The two had quite similar opinions. Patter 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 patter, ying. A shower of gold coins falling in the distance, a wind of billowing bills. Damien frowned as the rain of gold coins fell. Counterfeit gold coins look no different from the real thing, but because they are minted from fake metal, they are noticeably lighter in weight. Even if you get hit by a gold coin falling from a high place, it doesn't really hurt. You can tell right away if you hold it with your hand. Well, if it gets mixed in with the real ones, it might be difficult to tell them apart. Then what about bills? Banknotes are inherently light. It looks the same on the outside. Both counterfeit money and counterfeit gold coins are dyed with magic dye, so they will lose their color on their own after two hours. I have no intention of prolonging the chaos on the waterfront. It's exactly what Damien said. The counterfeit currency distributed throughout the imperial capital automatically becomes trash after two hours. But for at least those two hours, the empire's prices will be in shambles. Distrust of fiat currency will cause the citizens of the empire to become interested in real goods rather than money, and naturally the greed and desire for money itself will disappear. Thindy Wendy asked. But. What is the point of dropping the value of a currency to close to zero in just two hours? Two hours. That's enough time to decide the fate of a world. Of course, it would be too much for criminals like us. Damien touched his chin. And he answered in a low voice. For some extraordinary person who is risking his life at this very moment. 
Belial was astonished. No way. Why is recovery getting slower and slower? No matter how much money you suck, your physical strength will not recover. Money. Human greed. The value given thereby. There must have been something wrong with this cycle. There's no way humans don't want money. There is no end to their greed. But why? Belial seemed confused. It was natural since there was nothing that money couldn't do until now. However. Gold is not omnipotent. Vikir said, taking a step forward. After that, the words, for at least two hours were omitted. There is not much time left until the safe opens. In the meantime, the countless gold and silver treasures in the safe will gradually lose their value. Now that the entire empire is filled with distrust of currency, the world has entered the era of barter. Then the mountain of money piled up here has no meaning. Of course, it was only a short affair, but it had great meaning for Vikir. Flash. Bunchen's eight teeth, strengthened by divine power, viciously raged all over Belial's body. Dolores was constantly sending buffs behind Vikir's back. Lunianus homo omnium dominus est liberismus, nulli subiectus, is a free master of all things and subject to no one. A runiest is an entirely faithful servant of all things and subject to all men, Lunianus homo omnium servus est officiosissimus, omnibus subiectus. The souls of two men and women who have lived different lives resonate. Vikir unleashed his sword master's unique power without hesitation. Baskerville Type 8 The sword master's intermediate aura rotates at high speeds and cuts off everything it touches. The body of an iron man. The spirit of a superman. The body, trained to the limit, was loaded like a taut bowstring. The muscle fibers all over my body bristled like thorns and seemed as if they were going to tear my skin. The pupils were sharpened to capture the extreme point where the final blow would be delivered. A sharp and heavy weapon aimed straight ahead is shot forward, supported by only one big toe. And then a slash that threatens to tear the world apart. Quack 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 quack. Belial, swept away by the storm of aura, cried out as his whole body was torn apart and shattered. Yet. Vikir stood quietly in front of Belial. The body of Bartholomew, who was the host, was already completely ruined, and the body of Belial, who had appeared on top of him, also looked miserable. One of the thick horns was broken, and the other one also had many cracks. Black blood was gushing out from all over the disgustingly fat pig's head. Crack your neck. Vikir never let go of victory once he had it. The demon hunter's teeth ruthlessly digging into the demon's neck. A hunting dog bites a pig and kills it. It was a very natural sight. But. Gahaha. Belial burst out laughing at the last moment. Vikir narrowed his eyes as he saw his big pig nose twitch. What's funny? Because I look forward to seeing your expressions soon distorted horribly. After finishing speaking, Belial opened his mouth wide. Then black smoke started pouring out of its mouth. Decorabia, on Vikir's chest, spoke in a low voice. That is its last ability, oppression. What kind of power is that? After hesitating for a moment, Decorabia told the truth. It is the ability to make the person who killed one pay the corresponding penalty. That's right. Anyone who kills me will die. Belial agreed. The bastard rolled his lard glazed eyes and looked at Vikir and Dolores alternately. Whoever killed me will die. I will take you with me. The remaining one must be very sad, right? Because I lost a colleague. Gaha. Who will pay for killing me? Then Dolores said coldly. Why is it a sin to kill the devil? If it is a sin, I will kill you and pay for it. Tsk tisk tisk, doesn't the doctrine of runes say that demons are also creatures of runes and that all killings between creatures are sins? Can you really be sure? Belial's pig nose flutters. A little confusion appeared on Dolores' face. Right then. Don't fall prey to the devil's tongue. Vikir's sword cut off Belial's head in an instant. Phew. Black blood gushes out like a fountain. Belial rolled his eyes in disbelief. Oh, how can there not be an inch of movement? Me, on my tongue this guy aren't you afraid of sin? 
but Vikir didn't care at all. And. Widely. Something was attached to Belial's forehead. A piece of paper stained with black blood. Belial's expression, realizing its identity, distorted with despair. Indulgence. I forgive all the sins of this faithful church member. This indulgence was issued and guaranteed by the Old Testament faction, and counterfeiting can result in punishment. At that moment, a scene from the past appeared before Belial's eyes. A memory of one of countless descendants. If you can repent for sins you committed in the past, is it possible to repent in advance for sins you will commit in the future? But how serious of a sin is it that you seek such an expensive indulgence? I think I'm going to kill one of my neighbor's pigs. Okay. I'm giving it to you because I'm honored that I came this far with the life of just a pig. Tongarong. Yes, you have repented. It was an indulgence that Vakir had purchased at an Old Testament temple in the past, and its price was only one gold. Oh, no. Belial. A great demon who descended to destroy humanity. The life of an absolute being who monopolized all the wealth of the human world was replaced with an indulgence worth only a one gold coin. It's over. The worthless one. Vikir spoke briefly. And the magic sword Beelzebub drew a shorter trajectory than that. Pow! It was the moment when the sixth demon king's head fell. Episode 291, Successors, 1. Thud. The sixth demon king. Belial, the worthless one. The scene of his huge head falling was something that all of humanity and countless great heroes in past lives wanted to see, even at the cost of their lives. Vikir leaned back against the wall as he watched the demon's body die. I narrowly avoided falling. And as a result, we were able to watch Belial's demise until the very end. With this, the brains of the demon coalition are gone. A long war between the demonic army and the human alliance. The period of time between the end of the era of destruction, when corpses formed mountains and blood formed oceans, and when humans achieved an illusory victory. Belial, the entity that had caused the greatest tactical damage to the human coalition and caused the most civilian casualties throughout its long history, was eliminated. Now that Dantalian and Belial, who had disrupted the human coalition with their cunning brains, are gone, Bakir's shoulders feel much lighter. Gwei, are you okay? Dolores hurriedly ran over and helped Vikir up. Vikir spoke briefly to her. More than that. It's almost time. Yes. Time. What time ah? Only then did Dolores think of it. We are now in a huge vault and there is a limit to how long we can stay there. Dolores took out a pocket watch buried in a pile of gold coins and gasped. The safe door will open soon. When the vault door opens, it is certain that the bourgeois family's vassals and private soldiers waiting outside will come in. As soon as the door opens, it jumps out. Be prepared. Dolores nodded at Vikir's words. Depending on what Damien has done, the deployment of troops will not be that great. But even so, I couldn't let down my guard. In any case, it is a task of entering the family, assassinating the head of the family, and then running away. I'd better make it a picture of me kidnapping you. All right. If you take me hostage, it will be easy for me to escape. As soon as the safe door opens, you must run with all your might without looking back. But there was one problem with Dolores. She turned her head and looked beyond the pile of gold coins. Where Dolores' eyes turn, she sees a girl with white hair standing quietly in the corner. Sinclair. She was staring into space with a blank expression. Tsutsutsutsu. Belial's corpse is melting and emitting a tremendous stench. It disappears in an instant as if it had never been here before. On the floor, where the devil's corpse has all disappeared, only Bartholomew's body remains, his body grotesquely bent. Bartholomew's face is distorted in fear and pain. Sinclair's hands continued to shake as he looked at that scene. At that time. Sinclair. Wake. Dolores grabbed Sinclair's shoulder and shook him strongly. That is not the head of the bourgeoisie. You saw it too. I was a puppet for the devil to appear. Then the light returned to Sinclair's eyes. Percussion. She shook off Dolores' arm that was on her shoulder. 
don't come closer. Sinclair. Take my word for it. Really. The author is not human. It was the devil. Dolores spoke urgently. The safe door will open soon. A lot of people will come in here. Let's go together first. I'll explain everything. But Sinclair keeps his mouth shut and says nothing. Dolores felt something strange in Sinclair's attitude. Sinclair was usually a polite and polite junior who followed him well. He also had a quick mind, so he never did anything that would cause trouble to others. But Sinclair certainly looked different than usual now. A demon I had never seen before appeared and the head of a bourgeois family died after being manipulated. In a situation like this, wouldn't it be right to leave the scene and take a look? But Sinclair refused to join the night hounds. Dolores finally spoke earnestly. It's Sinclair. It's dangerous to be left here alone. Aren't you the ones in danger? If I stay here and tell you what I saw. But Sinclair remained uncooperative. An attitude that is strangely sharp, even though it cannot hide its anxiety. At that time. Chakong. Vikir stepped forward with his blade extended. Sinclair's eyes turn in this direction. Vikir spoke in a blunt voice. Do whatever you want. After all, I was the one who killed the head of the bourgeois family. The saint was taken hostage by me without knowing anything. That's what it will say in the article. Then Sinclair answered in a trembling voice. Are you going to kill me? If you need. There wasn't even an ounce of warmth in Vikir's voice. Sinclair shivered at the coldness. Go away. If you don't want to get caught up and die. It's the same voice I heard at the Academy's festival before, and the freezing coldness sends a chill down my spine. Vicar took a step forward, where Sinclair was standing stiffly. Vikir was lost in thought as he looked into Sinclair's silent face. Later, when the era of destruction began, a person whose name could not be found anywhere on the list of the Human Alliance. However, in the recollections of countless great heroes, he was talked about as a genius, an elite, and an extraordinary person. A mysterious female student who suddenly disappeared from the world after graduation and whose name was nowhere to be found. Should she be kept alive, or should she be removed from here? Vikir's judgment and choice were quick. Decide for yourself. A voice that breaks apart. What to see, what to hear, and what to believe. It weighs heavily on Sinclair's heart. You must decide what you believe. The moment Vikir turns around. Thud. Crunch. The door to the safe opened. At the same time, the sound was heard. Aya. What kind of mess is this? Ah, it's a sneak attack. Find the matriarch. All troops to the safe. Bourgeois, who looked very embarrassed, was the cry of the people. Quack. With a loud explosion, the night hound came running out of the vault. Squeak. 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 At the same time, gold nuggets and jewels whose value is difficult to estimate are scattered in all directions. While the eyes of the chasers who rushed in with spears, arrows, and magic wands turned to the treasure that had fallen on the ground, the hound of the night quickly jumped over the wall and escaped. On his waist was the sainted woman Dolores, who looked as if she had fainted. Hey, I got scolded. The matriarch has passed away. And even the saintess was taken hostage. If this continues, we will all be ruined. Catch. All troops to the outer wall. We must at least save the saint. No touch. Meanwhile, anyone who touches the property on the floor will be severely punished later. People from the bourgeois family who respond quickly to situations even in the midst of confusion. Among them, you can see the face of Damien, who must have just returned home from the currency-making country. Dolores slightly opened her eyes and asked at the sound of shouting coming from behind. Can I leave Sinclair like that? Vikir just shrugs. You seem like a smart friend, but I think you can at least figure out how to live your own life. If anything happens, you can just say you were out of your mind because of the sleeping pills. If you even talk about us. Who will believe you? 
No matter how smart Sinclair may be, he is nothing more than a newbie who has just entered the academy and a commoner with no background. It is obvious that if he were to tell what he saw in the safe, he would be considered crazy, and Sinclair himself would clearly know that there would be no benefit to him if he tried to do so. At that time, Dekaravia's low whispering sound was heard from Bakir's chest. He he he. It didn't look like he was going to open his mouth to me. That girl with white hair. When a problem arises, they are the type of person who tries to solve it on their own rather than relying on adults. Did you ever think that such a personality would cause more trouble in the future? I have an idea too. Vikir ran forward, gathering information about Sinclair. She still has value in many ways. Dry judgment. This is the best, even from a practical standpoint. Vikir looked down the wall. Truly strict vigilance befitting a Chabel family. It seems difficult to get through the crowds of people coming from all over. This is where I say goodbye. Vikir lowered Dolores to the floor with Madame Baby's threat. Night hunting what are you going to do, Ban? Just call it what you used to call it. And I also have a way out. Vikir jumped down the wall, leaving Dolores looking at him with concern. If you use Andromalius Ring, which can create subspace at any time, escaping would be easy, but the cooldown has not returned yet. So Vikir did the next best thing and put on a picaresque mask. Nucleus Nucleus In the midst of their busy schedule, not many people paid attention to the black puppy carefully crawling around the corner under the outer wall. Inside the safe. Damien was the only one left at the scene where everyone ran away. He bowed his head in silent prayer towards Bartholomew, who was lying dead on the floor. Older brother. What is this? The devil's corpse has already melted away. Only Bartholomew's body was in rags. How could the words of a person who had so much wealth and power be so miserable? Now that things are like this, what good is all the money and treasures that form the mountains around us? Damien let out a heavy sigh. I thought there would be no more surprises after my daughter's soul wedding, but when I found myself in this situation, I was truly disturbed. What is a devil and what is a gate? What on earth happened? Right then. It was you. A cold voice came from behind. It was sharp like a dagger and stabbed Damien in the back. The one who brought the night hound and the saint into the vault. Damien slowly turned his head at those words. Blue veins appeared on the hand holding the stilettos around my waist. At that time. Damien's eyes widened for a moment. The hand holding the knife suddenly lost its strength, and at the same time, the voice came out trembling. Juliet. For some reason, the daughter I had sent away with tears in her eyes was standing here with a cold expression on her face. Episode 292, Successors, 2. It was you. The one who brought the night hound and the saint into the vault. A tone of voice that seems to catch the insider. As soon as Damien turned his head, he was startled. Big deer-like eyes, clear pupils, and white hair that shines with silver. It looks like Juliet has come back from the dead. However, the optical illusion disappears literally in the blink of an eye. When I lowered my eyelids once and then lifted them up, I saw reality. The girl in front of me looked a little younger than Juliet and her hair was much shorter. Above all, she was someone Damien knew. Bourgeois Lord Sinclair Nephew of bourgeois Lord Damien and daughter of bourgeois Lord Bartholomew. The royal family of the bourgeoisie was standing there. Damien swallowed a faint moan. The reason he, who was the director of the Currency Manufacturing Bureau, attended a party hosted by mere academy students in the first place was because he saw this name on the list. It's a misunderstanding. Damien shook his head. It was true that he had a connection with the Hound of the Night, but he also did not know anything about the devil. It's something I've never heard of either. I just noticed it a little bit before everyone else and jumped in. In fact, it has not been long since I arrived at my hometown. Because of this, he was able to cleverly mix truth and lies. Sinclair looked at Damien blankly and then turned his head away. Well, that's it. Because that's not important right now. She stood before the body of her father Bartholomew. And he muttered in a low voice. There was one thing I wanted to ask. Now I can no longer ask questions. 
Sinclair recalled his time at the Academy. Questions about the future flow of the empire's economy, current financial indicators, standards for discovering new businesses, promising small and medium-sized merchant guilds, and the recent merger and acquisition issues between mercenary guilds and we should also ask whether chables eat chicken. I have a question too. Oh, Sinclair. What things are you curious about? Would you like to guess a question with me? No. I have only one question. Eh. Only one. Barely. Ha. Huh. Why not? I need to gain a lot of knowledge to meet the Empire's greatest boss. It's an opportunity you may never have again in your lifetime. While Piggy, his classmate, was writing down a list of questions with great excitement about meeting the Empire's greatest ruler, Sinclair had prepared only one question. However, it is of no use now that the person who was supposed to answer the question has died in a place like this. At that time. Why did you abandon me, is this it? That question. Damien, who was behind him, opened his mouth. When Sinclair was startled, Damien shrugged his shoulders. Juliet also asked me the same question. She was when she was alive. Juliet, too. Sinclair's eyes widened slightly. Then Damien bit his lip slightly. Sinclair's surprised expression was the same as Juliet's that day long ago. Yes. In conclusion, your father and family did not abandon you. Bourgeois family tradition. It is exactly as Damien explained to the night hound earlier. Ordinary young bourgeois people usually grow up and grow up within their families, but real people are different. Like a lion's cub falling off a cliff, the bourgeois relatives who will lead the family in the future have their surnames sealed and are thrown into society as commoners. Isn't survival in society just as difficult as survival in the wild? Achieving success in the imperial capital, the center of the empire, solely on one's own strength, without any help from parents or family. That is the process of proof. Essi, non vitere. The belief that it exists, but is not revealed. The bourgeoisie always fosters two or more leaders for checks and competition. In my generation it was you and me, in the next generation it was you and Juliet. Damien told Sinclair about it. Then he hesitated and added another word. I should have told you much earlier, but I don't know why you didn't. Moment. Throbbing. Sinclair felt a pounding headache. Blood was flowing from the place where the gold coin fragment had grazed earlier. Seeing blood brings back memories from before. It wouldn't be a bad idea to weed out useless relationships at this point. As of this time, all plays have ended. Bartolomeo, or rather, the word spoken by the giant monster floating above him. A useless relationship? Theater. Sinclair stumbled, holding his spinning head. Are you okay? Damien approached, but Sinclair was startled and stepped back. Sinclair is alert, like a very nervous stray cat. She slowly stepped back, raising her palm towards Damien. The look in your eyes as if there was nothing to believe in in this world. If the devil really took over my father's body who raised me when I was young. Which one is my father? Since when did it become like that? Damien didn't understand what Sinclair was talking about. But Sinclair continued to mutter something like that. What if my father wasn't my father from the beginning? So what happens? What if it wasn't the devil who died but the father? Or what if it's not the father but the devil? What is it, I don't know. Sinclair was in pain, messing up his hair. Suddenly, she raised her head. Hounds of the night. First of all, I have to see him again. Whether what the night hound kills is the devil, the father, the devil in the father's mask, or the father in the devil's mask, everything is a decision. Sinclair stood up and approached the body of Bartholomew in front of him. And then he stretched out his hand and closed his widened eyes. Goodbye, father. I will inherit the position of head of the family. Words that Damien behind him wasn't even thinking about. But Damien just silently looks at Sinclair's back. Yet. Sinclair's eyes sank. It looked as if he had made some important decision. Ha. Huh. OMG. He he he. A suburb far from the bourgeoisie. A side road leading to the ecliptic. 
a middle-aged man was running along a mountain path. His once clean face was stained with minor wounds, and his neat white coat was completely stained with muddy water. Humbert. Why is he, a cardinal of the great rune order, running so quickly, even abandoning his carriage? Damn. Shit. Bartholomew was the devil. I really didn't know. He walked through the bushes with a frightened expression. Just before Vakir's dinner with Bartholomew, Humbert had lunch with Bartholomew. This is because the imperial family began an investigation as the criminal chain leading to the Old Testament faction of Quo Vadis, Pseudosex, and the bourgeoisie was revealed to some extent. Humbert, who was afraid that he might be discarded through cutting his tail, met Bartholomew and threatened to blow everything if he was investigated or arrested. And there Belial revealed his true face. Humbert bowed his head beneath Belial and begged for mercy, and the capricious Belial willingly let Humbert live. When the moment of crisis comes, use this, weak human. They even gave me a gift as a bonus. Ugh. It's a gift from the devil. Humbert gripped what he was holding even more tightly. It is a round object made of gold. It was a sphere that looked like an eyeball. Since it contained the power of the demon King Belial, it was naturally emitting an unusual energy. Humbert had just come out of the bushes. Hi. What I saw before my eyes was a cliff that was as high as the sky. The moment Humbert gets scared and steps back. Rustling. The sound of tree branches crashing could be heard from above. Wawaya. When Humbert heard the sound, he was scared and fell to the floor. Humbert was lying down on the dirt floor and trying to cover his head with both hands. However, he had to question the fact that his hands did not reach his head even though he raised his arms. Uh. Humbert looked up and looked down at his hands and was immediately shocked. Both hands had disappeared above the wrists. Only hot blood was gushing out. Oh. I tried to take only what was in his hand, but you cut off his hand. A woman's tickling laughter is heard from overhead. Where Humbert hurriedly looked up, he saw a tree branch gently bending. And the person sitting on top of it is a monster with two horns. Ms. Uroboros. The one who made Humbert run away here. She cut off Humbert's hand. Ooh, it's pretty. Is this it? A sacred object said to have been received from the devil. She laughed as she touched the golden orb stained with blood. Give it back. Humbert gathered his courage and shouted. What is more worrying than the two limbs being cut off is that the devil's eye that Belial had bestowed on him was taken away. And of course Miss Ouroboros was not going to give it back. A man who claims to be a priest sold children for money behind his back, and is now working with the devil. There are so many different things. Ugh, ugh. Humbert flinches at her words that seem to penetrate his inner thoughts. However, Miss Ouroboros still only has an alluring smile on her face. Still, I don't hate it. A criminal like you. I'm collecting. What? Gather? The moment Humbert makes a puzzled expression. Squeak. Suddenly, something like a snake flew from behind and wrapped around Humbert's neck, making him sleepy. It was Miss Ouroboros whip. Whoa. Humbert was unable to resist even as he was dragged upstairs, strangled. This is because both wrists have already been cut off. Miss Ouroboros said in a laughing voice to Humbert, who was struggling like crazy in the air. I'll also teach you. Let's welcome the old era with me. Old times. When we say we should welcome something together, don't we usually say new era? Humbert questioned her words even as his consciousness was slowly fading. Then Miss Ouroboros spoke another word into Humbert's ear. The Warring States Period. Those were the last words Humbert heard in his right mind. Episode 293, Confession, 1. The entire imperial capital was in shock. Bartholomew, the head of the bourgeois conglomerate, was assassinated, and Cardinal Humbert of the religious him quo vadis disappeared. The the night hound was designated as the evil beast. It is said that the Hound of the Night broke into the banquet hall where Bartolomeo and the academy students were attending and took one of the students, St. Dolores, as a hostage and took a cowardly hostage. In the process, Bartolomeo made a heroic sacrifice and saved all the students. 
a truly holy, heroic death. Unfortunately, most of the survivors who saved their lives thanks to Bartholomew's sacrifice stated that they had no memories of that time. A student named Piggy stated that he did not see anything because he fell asleep, and a student named Sinclair, who was present at the scene, showed symptoms of aphasia and short-term memory loss due to an overdose of sleeping pills, a blow to the head, and psychological shock. Lastly, Saint Dolores, who was taken hostage herself, also stated that she could not see anything because she had a blindfold over her eyes. The incident was put to rest for the time being by the bourgeois family's acting head, bourgeois Damien, who issued an official statement saying, we will resolve the situation as quickly as possible, and since there is a successor appointed to the position of head of the family, the confusion will soon subside. However, no matter how big an incident or accident occurs throughout the country, humans and small citizens feel that the small things right in front of them are more important. Academy Colossio The biggest issues here were the upcoming final exams and the Parent Observation Day event. Even if it is the bourgeois assassination that is shaking the entire empire, there is no issue more important to students than exams. Now, let's start reorganizing the gym to prepare for the final exams. Please check the magic stones in advance in case of an accident. Is it okay for the trails for parents to explore to be this scenic? Let's plant more trees. If possible, we plant large trees. I'm sowing a lot of flower seeds too. As parents soon visited the school, large-scale beautification work was taking place in various parts of the school. As soon as Principal Winston returned, he began a large-scale greening project. Large trees and beautiful flowers were planted throughout the school, and soft music was played throughout the school. In addition, Principal Winston, who expressed great regret over the abnormality of the magic wall during the recent midterm exam, doubled the strength of the wall by placing additional magic stones. Beautification Project and Security Project These two were Principal Winston's main tasks. Students' opinions on this were divided. Why is the principal carrying out such a large-scale construction project as soon as he returns? School Bustle Well, since I've been away for so long, I haven't achieved much. We have no choice but to push ahead like this in a hurry. Hey, the school is half land and half wood. I'm not crazy about trees. A lot of mana stones came in. Now, the magical wall will become much stronger. What the? Since parents are coming, look at the construction being done to show off. It's not some kind of army, it's something I would normally do. How awesome is this? I heard that the seventh generation family will also send a representative during this parent observation class. Hey, I heard there's even a family where the head of the family comes directly. Meanwhile, Dolores overcame the shock of living in the bourgeoisie and returned to the front line as student council president. Contact with companies, selection of magic stones and landscaping trees, negotiation of unit price, transportation and landscaping, etc. She was leading all these complex tasks. Parents will soon come to the school to observe. Many high-ranking officials, including the seven great families of the empire, are coming, so let's make sure we don't neglect even one bit of hospitality. As Dolores said, the student council officers worked hard. Most families send a high-ranking person as a representative, but in rare cases, the head of the family comes directly, so each and every detail had to be paid attention to. While numerous students were preparing to welcome the distinguished guests. Phew. Dolores was sighing internally. I need to meet Piggy and Sinclair quickly. After what happened that day at Bourgeois Street, I saw Piggy a few times, but I never saw Sinclair. This is because that diligent child doesn't go to class and stays in his dorm room and never comes out. Part-time jobs are punk, volunteer work is punk, and clubs are punk. Everyone was surprised and whispering about the change in Sinclair, who had always been sincere. He looked very confused. Well, it's natural to be shocked when you see someone die right in front of you. Dolores is a saint, so she has seen many people suffering or dying, so she has less psychological resistance, but Sinclair is a commoner girl who grew up flawless. Of course, the shock is bound to be great. Still, I'm glad Sinclair didn't say anything in front of the reporters. Sinclair is smart. He is not the kind of kid who can make explosive remarks in an interview without any support. Then you said you were sharing the same room as Bianca, right? 
However, Bianca said that her relationship with Sinclair has not been very good recently and she does not go to her room often. I can't do this. Dolores thought that she had to go to Sinclair's room at least tonight. And in order to do that, we need to quickly complete the backlog of work. Ruler. Let's try our best again. Dolores cheered herself up, grabbed a pen, and started writing down the document. And amidst all these big and small changes. Notice regarding ranking match schedule. The final exam, the final exam for freshmen in the class of 20, has begun. A week later. As the final exams are almost finished, the ranking match results are almost out. The final exam was conducted by dividing the scores recorded during the midterm into sections, differentiating the levels, and then collecting partial scores by competing with students in each section. Those at the top are promoted, those at the bottom are retained. This simple rule motivated all students. Vikir, who ranked first overall during the midterm exam, saved face by defeating low bro and middle bro of the cold weapon department and losing to high bro. In the cold arms division, Bianca defeated Sancho in a close match and advanced to the finals, where she was about to face Tudor. In the fever section, Granui and Sinclair are approaching the final. The match between Tudor and Bianca and Granui and Sinclair was scheduled to conclude the final exam in a grand manner with all parents in attendance. And for this final, which everyone was watching, the four students were working especially hard to prepare. Among them, Sinclair's enthusiasm and tenacity were so great that they left everyone speechless. Push. The door to the gravity room opened and Sinclair walked out, his whole body soaked in sweat. A black sleeveless tee and combat uniform pants. Sinclair, who had withstood eleven times the force of gravity with a body without an ounce of mana, sat on a chair with an exhausted expression. Phew. No one could get close to Sinclair, who was sighing deeply. That was because Sinclair, who had been confined to the dormitory for a while and came out for final exam season, was showing unprecedented venom. Won by KO within one minute against all of the elites in the fever division that he had faced so far in the final exam rankings. This is true even though they are aces who had good midterm scores to the point that they were in the same tier as Sinclair. Sinclair became extremely quiet and his actions became monotonous. Sleep. Meal. Training. Sleep. Meal. Training. Sleep. Meal. Training. I didn't talk to anyone around me and was only focused on the task at hand. My relationships with my close friends also became strained. The cold tone and look in his eyes as if he was deliberately trying to alienate her. It was as if he had become a different person overnight. I also quit volunteer work at an orphanage, which I used to force myself to do when I didn't have time. Even when the orphanage children sent letters saying they wanted to see them, they just crumpled them up without even reading them. I have even quit all the part-time jobs I was doing responsibly. Even when Bianca, who shared the same room, worried, he remained silent. At that time, Sinclair, who had not paid any attention to his surroundings until now, suddenly raised his head. At the same time, the door to the front gravity room opened and someone came out. Push. Thirteen times the force of gravity. A score recorded solely with one's bare body. Vikir walked out, drenched in sweat, as a cloud of steam filled the air. Then Sinclair opened his mouth. You're still amazing. Sinclair, who acted as if he was going to organize all the connections around him, was the only person he spoke to first, and that was Vikir. Vikir nodded and wiped the sweat from his face and body with a towel. Sinclair jumped up from his seat and followed suit next to him. What does thirteen times gravity feel like? What should I do to survive with my bare body without using mana? What do you usually eat? When do you sleep? How on earth did you become so strong? What kind of training did you do? You just lost a high bro this time, right? Because you're tired of getting attention? In Vikir's view, Sinclair was still the same as before. She was still a very curious and bright girl. But... Vikir was also able to notice that the last question Sinclair asked had a slightly different energy than usual. Brother, what are you doing tonight? Assignment. I'm not going to stay up all night. It's not that difficult. 
there are also assignments from other major classes. It's night work. TCH. Sinclair's lips twitched at Bakir's blunt words. Don't you have time even though it's so late? Even at dawn? I'm not going to sleep. The assignment will be finished by dawn. Why? When Vikir asked, Sinclair hesitated for a moment and then spoke as if he had great courage. Gwei, if it's okay, would you like to have a late night snack in my room? Episode 294, Confession, 2 The night sky is turning blue. A small knocking sound echoed in the hallway in the dark early morning. Knock knock click. The low sound of the door handle turning is heard. But despite this, the door did not open right away. Vikir looked around for a moment. The women's dormitory at night is extremely quiet. A foul smell emanating from somewhere, perhaps due to the smell of feet or improper drying of laundry, the sound of snoring heard even through the closed door, and the shared lockers being damaged in several places. Overall, the scenery is not much different from the men's dormitory hallway. The moment Vikir confirmed once again that no one was awake. Sigh. The door opened shyly with a small sound. Hyung. Inside, Sinclair was sticking his head out. Sinclair, who checked Vikir's face, smiled broadly and whispered. Come on in. The door opens and the warm air inside touches my skin. The room, which had a sweet, unknown berry scent, didn't seem to be decorated very well, but it seemed quite quiet thanks to the props that created a cozy and antique atmosphere. Bianca. Wasn't it the same room? It felt like I was sleeping in another friend's room. My relationship with him isn't very good these days. Aren't you two the best friends? Why all of a sudden? Just. It's all my fault. LOL dash. Sinclair smiled awkwardly and greeted Vikir. She was wearing a white t-shirt and pink dolphin pants and had a wet towel around her neck. A faint shampoo scent was coming from the short hair that had not dried yet. Ruler. Brother. Sinclair threw something at Vikir. After receiving it without any hesitation, I saw a can of beer with cold water droplets on the surface. Sinclair grinned and took out the snacks. I can't eat anything because time is running out. Please bear with me even if the snacks are a bit meager. Does not matter. Thank God. Oh, by the way, bro, you're good at board games, right? Sinclair clapped his hands and pulled out various board games from under the bed. Games with simple rules like Jenga, Rummikub, or Uno. How is it? Would you like to hang out for the first time in a while? It's been a really long time. Vikir nodded. When it comes to board games, I used to play them ad nauseum with my comrades in my quarters before I returned. But for some reason, what came to mind before those memories were memories of my previous volunteer work at an orphanage. I guess I've become very dull too. Vikir once again felt that a lot had changed since his return. It was the same for the surroundings and Vikir himself. Clattering. Sinclair, seeing Jengdet collapsing in vain, messed up his hair with both hands. Ah really? Why do I keep getting caught? It is important to see the center of gravity. If you don't lean to one side and just maintain your balance, you will never fall. TCH. Easier said than done. Sinclair pouted his lips and piled up the next Jenga, but it wasn't long before he tore it down again. Ah, I really can't play board games with my brother. Why are you so good at this? He seems like a person who only does this after eating. There was a time like that. Huh. Sinclair opens his eyes like a rabbit. Instead of answering, Bakir just quietly closed his eyes. Soon, the number of empty beer cans crumpled up began to increase. As the alcohol rises, Sinclair's expression softened slightly. The red blush on her unusually white skin was getting darker. I want to go see the Milky Way. Bakir thought for a moment as Sinclair muttered something inadvertently. When I'm feeling down, I always come here and look at the Milky Way. This is what Sinclair once said. Now that I think about it, this guy said he goes to the rooftop if he has any worries. Drinking a can of beer on a rooftop with a clear view of the Milky Way may have been Sinclair's only way to relieve stress. 
But now, the rooftop of the famous Milky Way has become a restricted access area. This is because the student council president, Dolores, personally blocked the place. That was the meeting point while preparing to hunt Belial. Bikir stroked his chin once. And he asked in a low voice. Student President Dolores must be sad that the rooftop is blocked. At that moment, Sinclair was visibly shocked upon hearing Dolores' name. In her eyes, which were as wide and clear as a lake, the depth of water appeared for an instant. Bikir did not miss the commotion. What happened with the student council president? Bikir asked again. There is no way that Vakir does not know what happened in Bourgeois Street the other day. However, there was something strange that I wanted to point out again. I thought he wouldn't be a weak character whose spirit would be broken just by witnessing the fight between a demon and a demon hunter. Vakir looked at Sinclair with some puzzlement. However, Sinclair just kept his head down and remained silent. A room filled with silence. Vakir waited patiently, carrying a heavy silence. Then, eventually, the answer came back. I'm planning to drop out. It was so unexpected, completely different from the intention of the question, that even Vakir couldn't help but widen his eyes. What? In the world before the regression, Sinclair faithfully completes all four years and graduates from the academy. Literally. Sinclair is an alpha girl who recorded brilliant grades, first place in the entire school when she entered school, and never once missed the top spot in the entire school until her senior year. In the meantime, he took on the position of vice president of the student council in his second year and student council president in his third year, gaining prestige, but as soon as he finished his fourth year and graduated from the academy, he disappeared from the world and disappeared. But now the reality has changed. Just before Sinclair finished his first year, with only the final exam remaining, he announced that he would drop out. Of course, I haven't told anyone yet. The first thing I tell you is my brother. Sinclair smiled weakly. Vikir asked briefly. Is it because of the student council president? That's not right. It has nothing to do with the chairman, of course. I'm just so tired and tired. It was obvious that Sinclair's words were false. This was because Vakir knew that before she returned, she had graduated with the top honors from her first year to her fourth year in a straight line without taking a single leave of absence. I guess burnout has come. I've been wanting to quit school for a while now. So, I deliberately acted coldly to the kids to get them to get offended. Sinclair continued. But Vakir did not listen to her. I just asked a question that got straight to the point. It looks like there was some problem with student council president Dolores. Ah, uh, I said no. I just. Is it because of what happened in Bourgeois Street? For a moment, as soon as Vakir finished speaking, Sinclair's expression hardened. Also. Vakir realized that he had hit the nail on the head. A major incident that occurred in the bourgeoisie. The night we hunted the sixth corpse, Belial. Sinclair seems to have been particularly shocked. Oh, no. Nothing happened that day. She waved her hands in great confusion. But. Chin. Vikir just reached out his hands and grabbed Sinclair's wrists without saying a word. What's going on? What made it so difficult for you? Sinclair's pupils seemed to dilate for a moment and then trembled slightly. Vikir, seeing that, was convinced once again. Battles with demons are bound to remain as terrible memories for humans. The higher the demon hunted, the longer and more intense the battle. Vikir had seen many comrades complaining of severe aftereffects after demon hunting, so he was quite familiar with this type of counseling. If it is trauma after battle, we can help you overcome it. Vikir did not want Sinclair, who could become a great force for the human alliance in the future, to turn his back on the world and live in seclusion. But. Sinclair's next answer was definitely something that even Vikir had not expected. I killed him. What? When Vikir asked, Sinclair opened his mouth again with a severely trembling voice and his unusually inaccurate and slurred pronunciation. The night hound killed my father. The moment he heard those words, a shock occurred in Vikir's mind, as if lightning had struck him. The night hound killed only one person, Belial, whom Bourgeois had killed inside that night and the human body, the host, occupied by Belial. 
That was Bartholomew, the head of the bourgeois family. That means. The moment when Vakir organized the countless thoughts that came to mind and opened his mouth to say something. Whisper. There was a feeling of weight jumping into my arms. Sinclair leaned forward and simultaneously hugged Vakir's body. Sinclair appears to be crying, as his chest is getting warm and wet. Vakir froze in place, unable to push her away or hug her. The two men and women stayed still for a long time. How much time has passed? Eventually, Sinclair's trembling gradually subsided. The hound's mouth was half open, but he couldn't find anything to say to the lamb that was snuggled into his arms. Right then. Sinclair lifted his head from where he was buried in Vakir's arms and looked up. Now it's your turn to answer. Then he asked with watery eyes and a trembling voice. What do you think of me, brother? Episode 295, Confession, 3 Bikir was thinking about something else for a moment. Essi, non vitere. It exists, but is not revealed. Two successors aiming for the next peak of the bourgeois family. One was Juliet, the daughter of Damien, the second son, and the other was the child of Bartholomew, the eldest son. An entity of unknown gender, unknown age, and nothing is known. Coincidentally, my brother and I both have only one daughter. If it weren't for what Damien said, I wouldn't have known that Bartholomew's child was a daughter. Damien's daughter Juliet was revealed to the world when she dropped out of her exam, but no one knew where Bartholomew's daughter was and what she was doing. A person who was unclear whether he even actually existed. Sinclair was Bartholomew's daughter. Bikir rested his chin in thought. For some reason, when I first saw Juliet, I thought it looked very familiar. Was it because they were of the same blood? Then I think I know why she disappeared from the world after graduation. After graduating from the Colosseo Academy, Sinclair probably became the head of a bourgeois family. And the world would have moved on from behind a huge curtain of darkness that could not be reached by the world's attention. An upper class so distant that lower class warriors like Fakir before his return could not dare to have an audience with them, or even knew that they existed at all. Vips from all over the world. However, the tree that will grow so big in the future is now just a small cotyledon. What do you think of me, brother? So much so that he cried into my arms and asked such difficult questions. After hearing Sinclair's question, Bakir had to return to reality. Now. What is the purpose of asking this question? The question of what you think cannot be a question of what you really think. Bakir is not a fool. Rather, he prided himself on being quite quick-witted in these areas. In response to Bakir's rebuttal, Sinclair pursed his lips, rubbed his eyes, and answered bravely. Because dating my brother is the only achievement I want to achieve before I drop out and leave the academy. Achievements? Vikir opened his mouth half open. Was dating something so great that it could be called an achievement? But Sinclair seemed to think a little differently than Vikir. Originally, I planned to turn my back on the world after finishing my fourth year and receiving my diploma. Excellent GPA, award for various extracurricular activities, top of the class all four years, student president, Colosio Academy graduate. Well, I thought these qualifications were the most valuable things I could gain from school and at the end of my youth. Sinclair stopped speaking and smiled bitterly for a moment. That's why I didn't understand my cousin at first. She is one of my cousins who dropped out of the academy she was attending. Perhaps he is referring to Juliet, who attended the Miscara Women's College. Sinclair continued speaking, putting a little more pressure on the hand holding Bakir. But now I think I know how you feel. I too have changed my mind now. The most valuable thing you can gain from school life is not grades, diplomas, awards, or certifications. What is more valuable than that are the memories you have with the people you are with. Sinclair was giving a clear look with confident eyes. Bikir asked after much thought. Why do you place such value on me? I'm not that great of a person. If you think about it that way, what kind of person am I? Sinclair emptied a beer can and squeezed it in his hand. I know. Since when did I like you? I'm curious too. Would you like to try it again? She closed her eyes and opened her mouth with clear pronunciation and a pure voice. What she experienced, centered around her, from her perspective. 
From Sinclair's mouth, memories of his time as a freshman in the class of twenty slowly began to be written. Why do I have to go out? The little girl asks the old butler while hugging her teddy bear. The butler simply bowed his head politely and answered. When you come back as an adult, everything will be yours. With those last words, the girl had to leave the family. Nursery school. The girl studied tenaciously. While other children were lost in defeat or resignation, the girl always shone brightly with passion and hope. A prestigious elementary school. The girl faced status discrimination as soon as she entered school. Even if the score on the performance evaluation is low compared to the effort, even if cleaning duty returns strangely often, there is also subtle discrimination, gossip, and harassment that is invisible to the eye. The girl persevered. The results weren't always fair, but overall, looking back, they were pretty fair. All discrimination disappeared in the face of outstanding skills and continuous proof. The children who had been whispering behind her back gradually became anxious to become friends with the girl, and even the teachers, who had been prejudiced against her because she was from an orphanage, gradually came to like her the most. The girl's appearance, which began to shine as she got older, changed everything. The girl, who overcame all adversity, was admitted to Colosio Academy, the most prestigious university in the empire, at an unusually young age. Also as a senior. The girl was proud of the thought that her skills were being used even in such a large place. And the long-awaited Colosio Academy. Survive somehow. And come up. If it is helpful, use it, and if it is not helpful, throw it away without mercy. The girl finished her freshman oath by thinking over and over again what her father said when she was young. And the first class. There was no student smarter than the girl. The girl's skills worked even at the most prestigious university in the empire. The girl breathed a sigh of relief at that fact. At that time. A boy caught the girl's eyes. The first impression was ordinary. Messy hair that is not easily noticeable. A common name that can be found everywhere. SOSO practical skills and interview performance. However, in the class that immediately followed, the boy gave a nice blow to the professor who deliberately picked out questions that students were likely to get wrong. Um. Indeed. I got a perfect score on the written exam. Even the picky professor acknowledged that the boy's written score was perfect. It was a much higher score than the girl who scored 931 out of 990. The girl's next highest score was in the 700s, so the difficulty of the test was definitely the worst. However, there was a person who got a perfect score, and it wasn't the girl. From then on, the girl felt curious about the boy. I think it was the first time. For the first time, I felt like I wanted to get to know other people. The girl is objectively pretty and has a nice body. He was not only intelligent but also physically attractive. You are in a good position to benefit from interpersonal relationships. So the girl was confident when she approached the boy. He knew the boy wouldn't hate him. However, others have always approached you, but this is the first time you have approached someone else. So the girl spoke to the boy in a slightly awkward manner. Hey, over there. Questions about why I volunteered. The boy's answer was simple. I'm here because of the penalty points. Ah. Usually, when people ask why they volunteer, the answer is usually obvious. Sense of accomplishment, giving spirit, sacrificial spirit, etc. Nice words to hear. But it wasn't a boy. A boy who walks away as if he is annoyed. The girl followed behind him, feeling somewhat unfamiliar as it was her first time being treated like this. It's a coincidence that we are assigned volunteer work locations in the same place. Is it? Actually, it wasn't. The girl had put in a lot of effort, including begging the person in charge to volunteer in the same place as the boy. And that day, the girl thought she had become a little closer to the boy. Because I said it. The girl, who asked a lot of questions related to her written grades but didn't get any satisfactory answers, thought that the boy was such a brat. But. Contrary to the saying that he came because of penalty points, the boy really worked hard in volunteer work. The girl was surprised to see the boy doing the dirty work that required dozens of people to do, such as cleaning the bathroom and feeding the cafeteria, repairing the pipes and washing the laundry, playing with the kids and maintaining the playground. The person is fine. 
The girl muttered to the boy. That day was the first time in her life that the girl praised someone with sincerity. From that day on, the title the girl called the boy changed. Hi. Good morning. Brother. Why don't you act like you know? I didn't know it was a greeting to me. And since you are a classmate, please do not use the title Appa. Dot. Why? I am one year younger. Even if you speak comfortably, your brother is still your brother. It's uncomfortable to listen to. Okay. If you don't like my brother, call me by a different name. I'll think about it until lunch. From then on, the girl started calling the boy, Hyung A. You secretly don't have much immunity to women. The girl thought it was unexpected. This is because the boy's bare face, revealed when the shaggy hair that often covered his face was shaken, was shockingly handsome. At that rate, it would have already made several women cry, but the girl just tilted her head. Well, anyway. From then on, whenever the girl met the boy, she often pretended to know him. Maybe it was from that moment. The moment when instead of using the title, Appa, that everyone else would like, I used the slightly unusual title, Hyung Ah. The moment when you have someone who calls you by a special title. Could it be that the girl's guard, which she didn't even know existed until now, has begun to shift? When the girl approached the boy with strange emotions that she was not aware of, the boy said something shocking about his parents. There is no need for parents. Anyway, you have to get through the world on your own. Parents only function during childhood when help from others is essential, and are unnecessary other than that. The girl was a little shocked that there were people in the world who thought this way. Whether at daycare centers or prestigious schools, children's thoughts were always similar. Love for parents. Whether it is lacking or fulfilled, children will always draw it. Because the girl was like that too. But it wasn't a boy. So the girl came to admire the boy. And I also became sympathetic. A lot of things happened after that. We drank together and worked part-time. The girl felt her heart pound as she watched the boy save her friends from the accident that occurred during her midterm exam. It was the same when students from the school my cousin attended started a fight while riding the train to participate in the college league. Thank you for helping me earlier. Actually she was very scared. They seem like strong sisters. I was scared too. The girl laughed heartily at the boy's calm words. And I thought. The only person who can change his mind up and down like this is this boy in front of me. After talking about it, there's nothing special. Sinclair rubbed the corners of his eyes and laughed. Vikir remained silent for a while after Sinclair finishes speaking. Could it be that he couldn't bear that awkward silence? Sinclair opened his mouth again. And I am now confiding my biggest concern to my brother. What kind of thing is this while confessing? As I said before, the night hound killed my father. I don't know if you will believe it, but the student council president, Dolores, was next to him. The only senior I trusted and relied on during my school days was in the same league as the person who killed my father. I just couldn't believe it. Friend? Senior? Professor? I didn't know who to trust. So it's even harder to stay at school. Sinclair finished speaking and raised his head. I said this because I thought you might believe me. My brother has been consistently writing columns to newspapers criticizing night hounds. If so, you will know. What a heinous criminal the night hound is. Right now, the only one I have is my brother. Someone who will understand me. Sinclair could not finish his sentence and lowered his head. He just held on to Vakir's sleeve. However. I'm sorry, but I don't think I can receive your heart. Vikir shook his head resolutely. At that moment, Sinclair held Vikir's sleeve even tighter. Okay. I thought my brother would say that. So far, I've only seen one person with eyes like yours. It's my dad. Sinclair continued. He is a person who moves forward with grand goals that an ordinary person like me cannot even imagine. You can tell by looking at their eyes. My brother is the same type of person as my dad. I am pretty and have a nice body. Even at a young age. He is excellent at swordsmanship and good at using magic. And above all, I have the ability and patience to understand, 
support, and support my brother's life. It won't disturb you. I will do really well. Still not working. What should I do? How can I help my brother? At that point, Bakir cut Sinclair off. Now is not the time to think about things like relationships. That's obvious. A demon hunter is in love, something that would make the comrades who died first laugh. There is nothing more unsettling than creating a family for a person who does not know when they will die. What you must protect and what you cannot lose will only become a weakness. When Vikir shook his head with a serious expression, Sinclair's expression brightened slightly. Now. When Vikir raised his head, Sinclair spoke again as if he were nailing it. Not now, right? In any case, for now. Then, after your brother achieves his goal, will you have some free time? My goal is very long and difficult. Still a long way to achieve. No. It must be a truly grand ambition for someone of your age to say something like this. Sinclair continued speaking with a determined expression. Then one day, when you achieve everything you want. Can you accept me then? It was truly a difficult question. After thinking for a while, Bakir nodded. If that day ever comes. That's it then. Sinclair nodded, leaving Vikir's embrace and kneeling down. Then he lifted the beer can he was holding in his hand and took a shot of the remaining alcohol. Vikir stood up quietly. It's late, so don't go back now. At that time. Sinclair got up and followed Vikir. And then he opened his mouth. Brother. Can't you just give me a hug before you go? At those words, Vikir swallowed his heart. Still a small, young girl. But one day, that fearsome conglomerate will stand at the pinnacle of the bourgeoisie. How many hardships and trials did this weak child go through before returning to become a great hero whose name was not revealed to the world? Vikir, feeling guilty and indebted to Sinclair, closed his eyes tightly. At that time. Whisper. Sinclair hugged Vikir's waist. You can push it away for the rest of your life. So just for now. For now, just stay like this for a moment. There is moisture in the thinly trembling voice. Haha I wasn't really this kind of person. Her expression, muttering something random and embarrassing to herself, is not visible as it is hidden by Vikir's chest. Vikir paused for a moment, deep in thought. I don't have much time left to stay here either. Like Sinclair, Vikir also planned to leave Colossio Academy soon. The place I will work next will be a place so harsh and rough that the academy will feel like a cradle. It looks similar to the Colossio building, which symbolizes glory and prosperity, but its symbolic meaning is completely different. A fearsome structure that reigns over hardships and trials itself. Nouvelle Vague. And the Age of Destruction. Opening. Soon, a full-scale war against demons will begin. Episode 296, Last Semester, 1. Sigh. Principal Morg Banshee. He got out of bed and frowned as soon as he was greeted by the morning sunlight. His face did not straighten as he took off his cute, mismatched sleeping cap, eye mask, and pajamas. The dream spot isn't very good. I had a strange dream last night. A nightmare so unpleasant that not only my clothes but also my bed was drenched in cold sweat. It was a dream of a giant one eyed snake and a unicorn fighting. The one-eyed snake wrapped itself around the unicorn's huge body, constricting it, and tried to swallow it in one bite. The unicorn tried to resist by waving its horn, but everything was in vain as soon as the one-eyed snake opened one more of its closed eyes. The snake wrapped its left eye, which was unusually golden, and wrapped itself around the unicorn, swallowing it in one bite. Why, this is such a bad dream on a day when I have to report to the principal. Is it because of stress? Professor Banshee grunted and finished getting ready for work. The road leading from the official residence to the lecture building. He lightly ignored the greetings from his students and headed straight to the principal's office, ignoring even the greetings from his fellow professors. In my hands, I held a bunch of reporting documents prepared until last night. Knock knock. As soon as the knocking stopped, the door opened by itself. Inside, Principal Winston can be seen sitting, always with a gentle expression. Ha! Huh. Professor Banshee. You came early. 
Yes. I arrived about 1 minute and 30 seconds early. If you're busy, can I wait outside the door until your appointment time? No, no, no. Just come in. Winston waved his hand and summoned Professor Banshee. Banshee laid down the reports in front of him. This is the conclusion of the school greening project. As soon as Winston returned to his position as principal, he redesigned the academy's landscaping. Greening. It was a project to more than double the number of trees and flowers on campus. Winston had a gentle nature and loved planting trees. The principal's office was filled with all kinds of plants, so no one thought it was strange. We have also reinforced the new magic stone. During a midterm exam held not long ago, a student named Vakir found a gap in the magic wall and entered the stadium through it. Since this was an incident that could lead to serious trouble if misused, Winston had strengthened the academy's security with the newly released magic stones. However, Professor Banshee was quite skeptical about this. The new magic stone has the advantage of better mana efficiency and higher magic wall hardness than the old magic stone, but its durability has not yet been clearly verified. Ha ha ha. Isn't that why the old magic stones and new magic stones were placed alternately? Intruders will not know where the old magic wall is and where the new magic wall is, so they are bound to be confused. No, there couldn't have been an intruder in the first place. After speaking, Winston looked at Professor Banshee with sympathetic eyes. You always care about the safety of your students. I respect you. They are just small people who worry a lot about preserving their positions. It can't be. Even though Professor Banshee says that on the outside, I know that on the inside, he doesn't. So I worked hard to live up to that feeling. After speaking, Winston held something out in front of Banshee. It was a bracelet decorated with black seeds that looked like jewels. It was designed so that it could be worn on the wrist by adjusting the size of the thin gray roots that grew from underneath the seeds. It is the key to passing the new magic wall. It's a bracelet type. These days, many people are replacing locker rooms in bathrooms and gyms with something like this, right? It looks like the security is good. It's an artifact containing magical power. Is mass production possible? I make them by hand whenever I have time. We've already prepared everything for students, so all you have to do is distribute it. If the circumstances allow, we will gradually make some for the professors as well. As Winston spoke with a wide smile, Professor Banshee grunted and groaned. Then he held out a new document in front of Winston. That's enough about security. Next on the agenda. Hmm. What document is this? I don't think this was something that was reported in advance. This is not an official report. However, there is one thing I would like to tell you personally. Ho oh, what is it? Winston craned his neck toward the documents as if interested. Professor Banshee spoke after a moment of hesitation. The atmosphere within the ecliptic has been unusual recently. What does it mean to say it's not unusual? Look at the statistics. Professor Banshee pointed to various graphs, diagrams, and charts written on the document. Recently, the number of criminals in the imperial capital has been increasing subtly. That's because whenever a big event is held in the imperial capital, a lot of people flock. No. This is the rate of increase in crime relative to the incoming population. The crime rate itself is increasing due to the influx of population, which is higher than the normal level. Professor Banshee narrowed his eyes. And he analyzed the current situation in a cold voice. Recently, criminals from all over the empire have been flocking to the imperial capital. The number of reports of sightings of wanted criminals has also increased. That's a big deal. What is the Imperial Guard doing? Strangely enough, they say the arrest rate of violent criminals has dropped a lot these days. It is said that criminals run away in a deliberate manner, as if they knew their arrest plan in advance. Also, the whereabouts of some wanted criminals are completely unclear, raising the possibility that someone is helping them escape and hide. Okay. But what does that report have to do with the academy now? As you know, Principal, aren't there going to be final exams and parent observation classes at the same time soon? Things are chaotic these days, so why not push the date back? Then Winston burst out laughing. What is this Colossio Academy like? 
Isn't this a place where geniuses who will become great heroes of the empire are educated? What about the skills of the professors who teach them? In addition, the parents of the students are also each and every one of them. They are the backbone of the empire's armed forces. This is where these great people gather. What does it matter if there are petty criminals running around outside? But I understand and respect Professor Banshee's caution. So, aren't I also paying attention to strengthening security by replacing the magic stone? Professor Banshee could only nod. Well, no matter how hard the criminals outside try, they won't be able to do even the slightest harm to the parents who come here. In the first place, they were not an organization and were lowly beings with no ability or reason to harm the academy. Really? And this is the final report. Professor Banshee opened his mouth to Winston. This is related to the dismissal of Professor Suddy. Then Winston's expression changed for the first time. He had a truly embarrassed and sad expression. Has Professor Suddy had an accident again? Yes. A complaint has been received that he has been disloyal in his role as an advisor to the Imperial Guard. Oh my. During search and intelligence activities, it is said that he showed lax and negligent behavior, such as causing a disturbance due to disagreements with colleagues and losing or omitting important supplies or information. It is even said that he was absent without permission during the arrest activity. I found out later that he was drunk and asleep in his residence. Ha that damn drink! Professor Suddy would be a very capable person if he didn't drink. That too is a thing of the past. Certainly, in the past, Professor Suddy has done excellent work as an advisor to the Ecliptic Guard tracking team. In fact, almost all the criminals of that time were arrested by Professor Suddy. It was almost comparable to the achievements of the Marquis de Sade during his heyday. If anything, it would have been evaluated as the second coming of the Marquis de Sade. But now, I am just a loser who is addicted to alcohol and only laments his situation and denies reality. Professor Banshee fired back sharply, as if he had accumulated a lot. Then Winston closes his eyes and is silent for a while. Silence. How long did the heavy silence last? Winston opened his eyes and opened his mouth with a soft sigh. Punishment I'll do it. Something as light as a pay cut or suspension cannot be accepted. All right. In this case, I will be severely punished with my title as principal on the line. Only then did Professor Banshee close his mouth and retreat. I was wondering if saying that would end up as a light punishment. Eventually, after finishing his report, Professor Banshee left the principal's office. Giapuk, 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 Giapuk. As he was walking down a dark hallway, a black shadow began to move next to Professor Banshee. Professor Banshee stopped and spoke in a low voice. Did you recognize it? Then the shadow behind him bowed down behind Professor Banshee and opened its mouth. Yes. There were definitely a lot of things that went wrong. Banshee had separately hired an informant to investigate the principal. I need to know why they treat Professor Suddy so badly. The intention was to get rid of her, who was a thorn in his eyes at all costs. At that time, Professor Banshee's confidant told a surprising story. The reason why Principal Winston cares about Professor Suddy is to give full honors to noble descendants, to be an elite arresting agent with a high rate of arresting criminals, and to increase the number of members of the principal's faction, which is already very small, by at least one more, it wasn't because of these little things. Then what is it for? Then the henchman answered in a very quiet voice. It's probably related to the 47 unrest. It was a report that made Professor Banshee's eyes widen as if they were torn apart. Now, today's class is about major events since the unification of the empire. The professor said, tapping on the blackboard. The first-year freshmen were listening to the lecture today with expressions of enthusiasm. Said the professor. There are many major events that occurred after the unified empire, such as the conquest of the barbarians on the western front, the merger of the five great swordsmen, and the Nouvelle Vague prison breakout incident. No matter what, the biggest incident would be the 47-person unrest. Can anyone explain what happened? Then several hands rose from among the students. The professor pointed out the student who raised his hand first. Is it so? Shall we, Chief Sinclair of the Ordnance Department, give an answer? 
Then, with the sound of a chair being dragged, a female student stood up. Sinclair, a girl with white hair and a calm voice. She calmly began to talk about what she knew. The 47 people unrest is an unprecedented event that occurred 35 years ago, not long after the empire was unified. It was a situation led by 47 people, but each of them was the head of one family, so it is also called the 47 family unrest. That's great. Can you tell me more details? It was a treason incident in which 47 people staged a coup, massacred countless people, and invaded the imperial palace. As a result, 46 of the 47 people were summarily executed on the spot, and the one who survived is currently incarcerated in the Nouvelle Vague prison in a remote part of the continent. Also, the purpose of their coup is still unknown, and it is known in the world that they were simply an impure person aiming for the throne. Sinclair answered without hesitation, and the students around her let out small gasps at the sight of her. Sinclair. Hasn't something changed? Huh? What? I guess you're still smart. It's not that, it's the attitude. Atmosphere. Ah, that's right. There's something strangely cold about me these days. But it also has a strange charm. What can I say, I feel like I've become an adult. I thought that too. I became somewhat more mature overnight. I went from a girl to a woman. A girl who was always brave and bright. Sinclair's mood, which reminded me of a lively puppy, has changed a lot in the past few days. I can't pinpoint exactly what it is, but she developed a lot of maturity overnight. Just as a girl becomes a woman through some unknown reason of her own, Sinclair seemed to calmly accept and accept the internal changes that occurred to her. Eventually, Sinclair finished answering and sat down, and the professor clapped. That was a good answer, Sinclair student. I hope to show a good performance like this in the finals of the fever donation final exam that will be held later in the afternoon. The professor continued while looking around the entire classroom. I believe everyone knows. Not only you but also many parents will come to the final exams that will be held later. There is no way the students don't know that. There hasn't been any commotion since a few days ago, such as greening work, security work, etc. The principal himself planted trees and flowers and rearranged the magic stones. So most of the students reacted angrily. Anyway, the final exam was the stage for the four of them, Tudor and Bianca from the Cold Weapon Donation Department, and Granui and Sinclair from the Heat Donation Department, and they were the bridesmaids. Some students were excited about seeing their families for the first time in a while, but there were also many students who were worried that they would be scolded for their poor grades. Is that why? The professor revealed another piece of news to attract students' attention. And you all know that. We will soon have a new friend attending our school. Transfer student. It's always a fresh topic of interest. One student raised his hand and asked. Professor. Is a transfer student coming? That's a good question. But unfortunately, I am not a transfer student. The professor continued, waving his finger. It would be correct to call him a transfer student, not a transfer student. This is because you are not transferring your academic records from another school, but rather enrolling in a new school during the semester. Anyway, it's good to have new friends. Wow, what kind of friend are you? Female? Man? What about age? By the way, I'm curious which lady it is. Students asking questions with curious expressions. Then the professor smiled and answered. Gender is female. He is 19 years old, one year younger than the average freshman in first grade. My affiliation is with the fever division. Since she is a friend who is transferring from the famous Magic Clan Morgue, I think you will have a lot to learn from her. The student's name is. Episode 297, Last Semester, 2. Soon, the parent observation class began. The training hall where the final exam rankings are held. A stage where Tudor and Bianca from the Cold Weapon Department and Granui and Sinclair from the Heat Weapon Department compete for prowess. In addition, the second and third grade students with the best grades also enter the training hall. The same was true for Dolores, the student council president and valedictorian of the third year. The site was presented as an exemplary example in front of numerous parents. 
Parents and children met at the academy and exchanged memories for the first time in a long time. My son I missed you. Are you eating well? Hmm. But daughter. Why don't you participate in the ranking match over there? What? Is that the place where the valedictorian of the grade is decided? Aha, this isn't a stage where normal kids stand. Next time, make sure you stand there too. I'm relieved that my child is taking the same classes as such talented kids. Do you really want to make friends like that around you? That's why I sent you to Colosio Academy. While parents respond in a variety of ways, including encouragement, pressure, and praise, new competition and friendship structures emerge. In the first place, the parent observation class was an event aimed at having this effect. Meanwhile, Tudor and Bianca, who are about to compete in the final exam, were exchanging nerves even before the match. My father came to see me, so I can't show him how embarrassed I am. I'm sorry, but I have to step on you. My father came to see me too. I can't see you today. You're talking as if you've always looked after me. My grades on the midterm exam were lower than mine. It's not. I was higher than you. You were in sixth place. I was in third place. Yeah, that's before the performance evaluation, attitude score, and extra points for extracurricular activities are taken into account. In total, I'm one point higher than you. Are you even taking all that into consideration? Doesn't care. Today, I will overturn all the little things. Turn over. I guess I said something wrong about searching. What kind of girl likes talking so much? It's really bad. What does it have to do with being strong with a girl? If you think about it that way, why are you such a weak guy? Aren't you weak? Ugh, just start the match. It's really bad. You're really not that good either. Tudor and Bianca continued to argue. Meanwhile, a cold, desolate wind blows between Granui and Sinclair in the fever department. It was Granui who broke the silence first. Hey commoner. Starting today, I, Granui, a new member of the noble faction, will reclaim the top position. Senior student of the year. The next student council president position cannot be given to a commoner. No complaints. Okay. Granui held as much weight as he could, hoping that Sinclair would react. But nothing came back. It's also childish. Sinclair just muttered as he looked at the distant mountains with an unfazed expression. The innocent and bright childlike feeling that I usually felt about her has disappeared, and instead, she has the aura of a much older sister. Granui wondered why Sinclair had changed so much overnight, but for some reason he felt his heart pounding. Yet. The voice of the professor who served as host shouted loudly. Ruler. Mothers and fathers, please pay attention. The final exams for each grade are starting soon. It was the moment when the final event of the final exams began. It is quite far away from the training hall where the final exam ranking match is held. A person was standing on a wicker bench with an old well. Dolores Rune Quo Vadis. Senior third year student and student council president. The final match of the final exam is decided to be hers. Once the competition between a total of four first and second year students in the heat and cold weapons division is completed, it will soon be Dolores' turn. But right now, there was something she was more concerned about than her final exams. It was a match for first year fever donors. Among them, it was Sinclair. What should I say to Sinclair? Sinclair, who advanced to the finals today, was told that no one would show up during parent attendance. Dolores planned to approach Sinclair and try to have a conversation when the match was over and everyone's interest had waned. But how should I talk to him? After what happened that day at Bourgeois Street, Sinclair did not want to see Dolores. Although he seemed to be trying to detach from everyone, he was showing a particularly more closed attitude toward Dolores. Well, it's natural. I experienced something so scary. When Dolores sighs, not knowing how to approach Sinclair. Her eyes turned round for a moment. A familiar face was passing before my eyes. A male student trudging towards a well in the distance. It was Vikir. At that moment, Dolores remembered what Sinclair had said in the past. Really. 
should I ask my brother to do the same? Memories of when I first formed an Oracle Investment Club to hunt Belial. Is he interested in this too? Sinclair answered Dolores' question with a bright expression. Vikir is also very good at these things. Since I always read all the newspapers, I know how society works, and recently I seem to be very interested in the economy. For example, trade with Western natives. He also reads all the economic newspapers from a very long time ago, and his enthusiasm is truly amazing. My brother comes to the library often, so I'll talk to him when I meet him when I'm a librarian. Oh, that's right brother, I don't know where you are shooting around like that these days. Piggy is in the same room. Do you know anything? At that time, Sinclair seemed to have a great deal of affection for Vakir. If so, it was clear that the two were quite close friends. Dolores jumped up and faced Vakir. He intended to ask Sinclair to make room for a conversation. Right then. The little boy ran in front of Dolores. Hair as black as ebony, red eyes, white skin, and cheeks like glutinous rice cakes. Cute like a doll. I couldn't see it clearly because it was a quick glimpse, but there was a girl who was cute and cute from head to toe, running towards Vakir in front of her. And soon, the girl said something unbelievable to Vakir. Daddy Dash. Dolores was shocked by those words. They say a well-behaved cat climbs onto a stove first, but didn't this climb up too quickly? Oh, no. Who on earth is this kid's mother at that age? The moment Dolores pauses, speechless. Chin. Patter. Vikir grabbed the girl by his side and quickly began to run forward. Uh. Ugh. Dolores hurriedly came down from the hill where the bench was, but Vikir had already rushed down the path by the well beyond. Vikir headed to a place with few people. Vikir stopped next to an old well and finally put down the girl he was holding at his side. Pomerian. When did you get here? Who is the guardian? He he, secretly pay the installment plan with my uncle. They don't let me play all the time. Vikir placed his hand on his forehead at Pomerian's playful words. I recently heard through Thindi Wendy that they had left for the imperial capital to visit parents. It seemed like high bro, middle bro, and low bro were dealing well, so I let my guard down. If people found out that Pomerian was gone, there would be chaos. Before that, I had to quickly bring it back to its original position. Vikir took Pomerian's hand. Come on, let's go. Uncle will take you to the front. Yes. Pomerian still blinked at Vikir's words. As we walked down the path below, holding hands, Vikir cautiously asked about Pomerian's current condition. How is the revenant tree doing these days? Grow up well. But sometimes I have nightmares at night, so I'm relieved. It's a nightmare. What kind of nightmare do you have? When I have nightmares, demonic things keep coming out and destroying me dash. Pomerian trembled once. Vikir nodded and patted Pomerian's head. The demons in your nightmares also have nightmares. Does Mare appear in the devil's nightmares? This uncle comes out. When Vikir takes out Beelzebub from his wrist and shows it to him in an eerie voice, Pomerian's eyes sparkle with a light of longing. Oh wow, Uncle Mercy. So there is no need to be afraid of anything like the devil. Because I have this uncle. So, Pomerian can raise the revenant tree without any burden. One day, it will add great strength to the human union. Right then. Someone grabbed Vikir's collar as he was about to leave the well. The moment when Vikir turned his head in surprise at the hand that approached him without any sign of affection. Oh my, I'm thirsty. Where is the well here, old man? An old woman appeared somewhat unexpectedly and was pulling the end of Vikir's coat collar. A shabby white priest's uniform, a hunched waist, a round face, glasses resting slightly on the bridge of the nose, eyes squinted as if gloomy. No matter where you look, she is just an ordinary grandmother. But when Vikir saw her face, he was shocked to the point of being heartbroken. This person, this was the biggest variable in this parent observation class. Episode 298, Last Semester, 3 Oh my, I'm thirsty. Where is the well here, old man? An ordinary-looking old woman asks. 
but Vikir could not treat her like just an ordinary old woman. Nobakov Run Kovati's I. Pope of the Rune Church. The head of the Quo Vadis family. The oldest among the very few classical saints still in existence. Literally a living legend, who has survived for over 200 years, from the Warring States period before the Unified Empire to the present. Before his regression, he was a person I only heard about in history books. Pope Nobokov was already dead when he entered the War of Destruction at the age of Middle Age, before Vikir's return. Originally, there was a strong theory that he was poisoned by Humbert, who was blinded by power. But now that Humbert is missing and gone, her life has been extended beyond what was originally planned. The future has changed. That was the reason why she was considered the biggest variable in this parent observation class. How much of a help will Pope Nobokov be for the future of humanity? Since it was something he had never experienced before before returning, Bakir also knew nothing about it. When I saw it in person like this, I don't think it will be of much help. Nobokov I, whom I met in person, was not in very good condition. It's impossible to judge just by appearance, but he has a small physique, has dim eyes that make it difficult to properly recognize objects in front of him, and seems to have a slight tendency to have dementia. At that time. Water. Where is the water? It's you old man. Pope Nobokov began to protest. She struck Vikir on the head with a trembling hand. Vikir fell silent for a moment in response to the attack, which did not contain any force. Among the comrades who crossed the front lines of destruction together, those who were priests always lamented whenever they got the chance. If Pope Nobokov had been alive, the United Nations would not have been pushed back this far. Of course, it was a time when Vikir did not believe in anything unless he had experienced it himself. However, no matter how I looked, I could not sense any strength or power from the dementia old man in front of me. It was a very different feeling from when I met Count Kane Corso, who was of a similar age. In the end, Bakir shook his head with a small sigh. The water fountain is over here. I'll give you some water. I'm thirsty for inspiration. Quickly scoop it up. Bakir took Nobokov to the water fountain in front of him. A large jar-shaped drinking fountain was filled with clear water and gushing out, with bowls of gourds hanging next to it. It looks like an ordinary mineral spring. Bakir caught one of them. The moment you scoop up clear water with it. Ruruk. Water began to leak from the bottom of the bowl. This is because there was a hole in the floor. This. Water is leaking. I'll give you another one. The moment when Vikir puts down the bowl and is about to pick up another bowl. With a plop. The bowl sank into the water. When Vikir turned his head, he saw Nobokov coming up next to him and throwing the cracked gourd into the water jar. If you do this, it won't leak. Nobokov was laughing, and Vikir quietly looked at Nobokov. As expected, water was not leaking from the cracked bowl. That's because I fell deep into the water. Nobokov said to Vikir. Inspiration. Whatever is natural is best. Something natural. What is that? What's natural is natural, right? Do I really have to tell you that? Nabokov's eyes are kindly curved as he quietly looks at Vikir's face. The answer is to just leave the broken or holy floor as is. If you embrace and embrace something bigger, you can fill any hole or leak at the bottom. Hal 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 dash. But. But if I do this, won't I be able to drink it? Nobokov responds to Vikir's words. And his eyes widen. If this happens, the gourd will sink to the bottom of the water and you won't be able to drink it. Yes. Well. And since this is drinking water that everyone drinks together, you should not engage in such unhygienic behavior. When Nobokov had nothing to say and left his mouth half open. Pope. From a distance, I saw Dolores running, panting. Mosgus, with a contemplative expression, was also coming behind him. Pope. You are here. I waited ten years. Hal 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 hal. Mosgus quickly came over and picked up Nobokov. Luther, what about that guy? Unfortunately, you couldn't come today because there was a performance for seniors living alone. Ah, that's just like him. Are you here to drink water? Would you like to raise a glass? 
That's it. I'm not going to eat. Then why are you here? Nobokov took his gaze away from Mozgus, who had a puzzled expression, and looked back at Vikir. Vikir standing still and Dolores cowering next to him. Nabokov's eyes turned more benevolent as he looked at the two. Don't try to force the gap. It's best to embrace everything naturally. Thank you, young man. Thanks to you, I can go with peace of mind. Nobokov finished speaking and tapped Mozgus on the shoulder. As she turned away after saying something incomprehensible, behind her was a cracked bowl filled with water that had sunk into a water jar. Vikir and Dolores were left alone. Hello Sam Chun. This is because even Pomerian just walked away holding Nabokov's hand. After a little silence. Hmm. Excuse me. Dolores spoke first. I thought you were talking about filling a cracked basket with water earlier. The Pope has been a bit distracted these days. Don't pay too much attention to it. You've been saying strange things a lot lately. However, Dolores, who actually says this, seems to be thinking deeply about Nabokov's words just now. You must be able to freely handle the resonance phenomenon that was felt when you applied the blessing buff to the Nighthound. For that to happen, the Pope's advice is essential. Pope. Among the classical saints, she is the oldest and possesses noble divine power. In the past, the naughty classical saints often spoke about awakening. At that time, I should have listened to it a little more carefully and not thought of it as meaningless nagging. This is something I clearly felt when fighting Dantalian. Ever since then, Dolores has needed Nabokov's advice to be of more help to the Nighthound. Although Nobokov was showing signs of dementia, he received little advice. Dolores placed her chin on her face with a serious expression. She thought about what had happened in the fight with Belial not long ago. There is no need to try too hard alone. Because I'm a colleague. Before she knew it, she was crying and laughing at the words of the night hound. The moment he acknowledged me as a colleague, a hot fire arose inside my chest. However, it was a world of difference compared to the resonance phenomenon she felt during the fight with Dantalian, so Dolores mustered up the courage to ask. Hound of the Night. Please tell me your name. Dolores asked for his name in order to bridge the gap between her and the Night Hound and understand him more deeply. In order to increase your divine power, you need that resonance phenomenon. It's okay even if it's not your full name. Even the smallest nickname I can call you, can't you just tell me a little bit of your name? Of course, there was also some selfishness involved. And that was the first time I heard a word of his name. Half. His name I was so curious about. The touch of hot breath, which she still clearly remembered, made Dolores' ears turn bright red once again. Tom Siang Miang. The process of getting to know each other by going through each other's names. The name truly contained a mysterious power. Just by hearing that, Dolores was able to pull her tired body and create an amazing miracle. Okay, that's it. That's okay. A phenomenon that cannot be performed or explained to anyone else. Only the Night Hound know, it's a miracle that only happens when you're with Ban. When Dolores remembered that time, she felt her heart beating faster again. At the same time, my head turns quickly. At that time, when I heard the name, Ban, which is part of the name of the Night Hound, the resonance width increased significantly. I think the problem was probably the distance between the two. The closer the distance is, the stronger the effect of the divinity buff becomes. What should I do to further reduce the distance between me and the Night Hound? How can I create a stronger resonance? The Night Hound and Dolores. The gap between the two is still widening. As long as this gap exists, Dolores' divine power cannot perfectly resonate with the soul of the Night Hound. Soul Mate Factors for a Saint to Awaken For soul resonance, there must be assimilation of emotions, and this is possible only when there is mutual understanding. Dolores wanted to learn more about the person called the Night Hound. I understood his fate, sympathized with his suffering, and was prepared to sacrifice for him. Is that why? Dolores was also getting impatient. The more impatient you become, the more difficult the road ahead becomes. This applies to dreams, hopes, the future, and human relationships. Hound of the Night. I want to know more about you. I want to meet you. 
His expression was so determined that reporters in the past misunderstood him as declaring a holy war. Now I even feel pathetic. Right then. Yes with this, the final winner of the second grade ranking match has been decided. Now, the long-awaited third year is up next. This is the final ranking match to determine the top third-year student. In the distance, a broadcast was heard from the training hall looking for finalists for the third grade. Dolores said in a panic. Ah. Rain, Bakir. Excuse me. Actually, I came to you because I had something to say. Oh, I guess I'm running out of time. I was thinking of going down too. You tell me as you go. Oh, will you do that? Thank you. Actually, it's related to Sinclair. I want to talk to her, but I was wondering if you could make room for me. Bikir nodded to Dolores' words. Even if we talk, there probably won't be much gain. Sinclair's will already seemed determined. It probably won't change with just a few words from those around you. So, instead of focusing on what Dolores said, Bakir was looking at other things. A tree, and a magic stone. Trees are densely planted all along the road leading down to the training ground, and magic walls rise along the outer wall of the academy. Bakir scanned them with a sharp gaze. The arrangement of the tree roots and magic stones is quite exquisite. It doesn't matter if the trees or magic stones are placed separately, but if they are cleverly mixed in this way, there is a risk of a security incident occurring. Moreover, these newly arrived magic stones had a very slight but distinct odor. The smell of the devil that only night hounds can smell. Now it's time to leave the academy. A considerable amount of time has already passed since I stayed here. A place that I have become attached to in my own way. But nonetheless, Bakir resolutely turned his head away. Making all lingering regrets useless. A terrible fight will soon take place from which we may never return. Episode 299, The Era of Warmongers, 1. With the ranking matches for first, second, and third year students completed, all final exams at Colosio Academy have ended. Now, students will go to the auditorium with their parents and participate in the closing ceremony. Immediately after that, it's vacation time, and after a brief consultation about your academic performance over the past year, you can return home with your parents. Numerous people, including students, professors, and parents, flock to the main auditorium in the center of Colosio Academy. And among the crowd, there were some who stood out. A huge figure, almost three meters tall. A man who peeled off the skin of a sea lion with fearsome tusks, covered it in its entirety, and carried a huge spear on his back the size of a whaling ship's harpoon. A handsome man with a blonde mane like a beast's mane and a bold look was laughing. Son. Congratulations on winning. This father keeps smiling. Chang He Chang family Don Quixote's family head, King Chang, Don Quixote La Mancha Cervantes. He was laughing cheerfully, repeatedly patting his son Tudor's shoulder. Then a gloomy voice came from next to me. Are you telling me to listen to this now? Although he has a skinny body, he is tall enough to rival Cervantes, has a pale complexion like a corpse, large but gloomy eyes, bloodless and thin lips, and long hair as thin as a spider's web. The head of the royal family usher, the royal ghost usher for Roderick. He glanced back at his daughter Bianca, who was following him in silence, then fixed his gaze again on Cervantes. I congratulate my son on his victory. Although I don't know if that win is worth celebrating. What? Every win is something to be celebrated. Are you trying to force your daughter because she lost to my son and finished in second place? Uh. Like John Penji? John Pain. It can't possibly be like that. Usher opened his mouth to Bianca who followed him. Daughter. Tell me clearly why you withdrew from the final round of the last match. Yes, father. Bianca moved her gaze to follow Usher. There was a tutor looking angry. I have no interest in making jokes in front of large audiences. I'm not a monkey in front of a medicine seller. What? Monkey. Then why have you been fighting as hard as you can until now? Are you really that stupid? Until the finals, we competed privately within the school, just among ourselves. Parents also attend from the finals onwards. 
I don't want to show off my family's secret archery skills to these idiots. So, at the critical moment, Bianca retreated slightly to avoid Tudor's spear, and then went outside and abstained. Usher chuckled. A monkey in front of a medicine seller. Please refrain from expressing too much criticism, daughter. In the laws of the empire, there is something called defamation of character by time of fact. Yes, father. The law is strict and must be followed. There seems to be a saying in the far west that says, Imokjishin, dot. Usher and Bianca rushed towards the main auditorium with the attendants following them. Then Cervantes, Tudor, and the Don Quixote family attendants who were left behind began to snort in unison. Stand there. Hey Usher. Gloomy jamping. Why don't you try a game with me here? Ugh. Bianca. You are. For some reason, I abstained in vain. Come on. Stick again. It was a sight that made me think that a father and daughter really looked alike. But soon the gaze of the people around them quickly shifts. In addition to the figures of the House of Usher and the House of Don Quixote, there were many notable great people. For example, Hobbes of Leviathan, the head of the extremely poisonous Leviathan family, and his youngest son, Granui of Leviathan. The patriarch of the religious family Quo Vadis, Nobokov Rune Quo Vadis I, and his immediate attendant, Saint Dolores Rune Quo Vadis. Osiris Les Baskerville, the head of the iron-blooded sword family Baskerville, and his half-brothers Highbro Les Baskerville, Middlebro Les Baskerville, and Lowbro Les Baskerville. The seven pillars that support the empire, each family rivaling the power of a nation. It was truly spectacular to see the leaders of all the families, except the conglomerate bourgeois and the magic head family morgue, gathered in one place. Meanwhile, the crowd walked along the main street surrounded by magic walls and trees and finally reached the main auditorium. There, the professor's speeches had already been prepared. Principal's speech. And the principal's speech. Finally, the entire event ends after awarding commendation certificates to the top first, second, and third year students. And everyone was buzzing with anticipation for the upcoming vacation. Soon, Professor Banshee stepped forward to the podium on the stage. Hello, students, faculty, and parents. This is Morg Mu Banshee, who holds the position of vice principal. Professor Banshee. He looked at the crowd gathered under the platform with snake-like eyes. The power of the principal's faction is minimal. Principal Winston is incompetent, and since he's been out of office for so long, he'll probably be removed from office soon. Then, the next principal will be me. It was natural for Professor Banshee to make this judgment. Since taking office as vice principal, he has consistently recruited rank-and-file professors under him. They are the so-called sympathetic faction. The number of professors gathered under the podium was extremely small. It can be seen that the sympathetic professors are lined up next to each other, unable to even make a sound due to the pressure. And this conflict between professors was also affecting students. Aristocratic faction. And Hajakpa. Both of these organizations, which divide the top students, are unofficial. However, they clearly existed as a force and their position was below the sympathetic professors. Sympathetic professors supported by noble and aristocratic students. And of course, the person the sympathetic professors supported was Professor Banshee. On the other hand, the organization under the professors of the principal faction, which has little power, is of course the official organization, student council. Aristocrat and noble students under sympathetic professors. And even though it is the ruling party, the principal professors and the student council under them cannot show their courage properly. Professor Banshee was able to understand all of these power structures at a glance. Yet, before his eyes, he sees Dolores, the student council president and valedictorian of the third year. She looked tired due to overwork over the past few days. Professor Banshee clicked his tongue inwardly as he looked at Dolores. Unfortunately, this is the situation of adults. The circumstances of young children are naturally influenced by the circumstances of adults. There is no housemaster, Dolores, student council president. When Professor Banshee shifts his gaze, thinking about this and that. His eyes widened slightly for a moment. 
This was because there was an empty seat between the rows of professors who were already few and far between. It was obvious who was missing from this important event. Professor Suddy. This guy is really. The banshee was so absurd that it was almost speechless. That crazy female professor didn't even attend her colleague's speech. He is truly an irredeemable human being who has nothing to say and no answer. Well, even from Principal Winston's point of view, it might be better for such troublemakers not to come. As a school principal who already has no people, it would be a shame for each and every professor it's a different story if you're an idiot who always causes accidents. Professor Banshee was genuinely curious. Why does Principal Winston keep trying to keep such a nuisance in the school? Respect for the bloodline of the Marquis de Sade, who was once a great nobleman. Or Professor Suddy's mighty force. Or the achievement of arresting numerous criminals. Maybe just fill in the numbers. No, no. Professor Banshee recalled his confidence report not long ago. The reason why Principal Winston cares about Professor Suddy is probably related to the 47 unrest. Dot. Although the report was only a few hypotheses based on circumstantial evidence, the fact that this incident was even mentioned in the first place was an extremely serious matter. Principal Bastards. What on earth are you planning? Professor Banshee glanced at the side of the podium with cold eyes. There, as expected, Principal Winston can be seen waving to the students with a gentle expression. What can you read from that innocent expression? Professor Banshee opened his mouth on the podium with a short sigh. I would like to express my love and respect to all those who have gathered at Colosio. At our academy this time. The consequential stories continued for a while about how many graduates were employed in prosperous jobs, how noble their academic achievements were, and what great human beings they had become. Students at Colosio Academy may emotionally dislike their parents and teachers who strictly guide them, but these students teach their children and students, who will soon embark on a difficult journey, the stamina and wisdom to overcome hardships and adversity. These are precious people who give. Thank you to all the students who have just entered school and those who will soon leave school for their hard work throughout the year. Some students have tears in their eyes. Professor Banshee continued his speech in a harsh but warm voice. May you always have something to do in your hands, may you always have a spare coin in your wallet, may a path always appear before your feet, may you be slow to make enemies and quick to make friends, may your neighbors always be kind. May the mean people respect you and not pretend to know you, may the wind always blow at your back and the sun shine in front of your face, may it rain occasionally on your journey, may there soon be a rainbow, may you be poor in misfortune and may you be poor in blessings. May you be rich, may the saddest day you ever experience be better than the happiest day you have ever had. And I will pray with all my heart that your destiny will always be filled with peace, love, hope, prosperity, achievement and satisfaction. Professor Banshee concluded his speech with a short, sermon. The students applaud loudly. The response of support was especially strong among students from the aristocratic and noble factions. And continuing that atmosphere, Principal Winston stepped up to the podium. He looked back at the students with a bright smile that was unusual for his age. I feel burdened because the vice principal said such good things about this. Ha, huh, I should have thought of a good speech too, this is it. Then, light laughter echoes through the auditorium from among the audience. Yet. Winston began his sermon with a serious expression and voice. This may be common advice, but I want to tell you to do your best at every moment. He said, looking around with appealing eyes. As those of you who know me know, I have been taking a break from school for the past few months. This is because my health has deteriorated significantly due to the mana surge. Because Winston had been absent from the principal's position for a long time, Banshee was able to skip many formalities and be immediately appointed as vice principal. Now, he has pushed out the principal's faction and is in control of almost the entire school. Among the parents, professors, and older students, there was almost no one who was unaware of this complex power structure, so they all just nodded their heads in silence. Meanwhile, Winston appealed more and more honestly and in a voice that touched his heart. After seeing the pain, I understood. How precious is health in this moment. Since life is such that you don't know if you'll die tomorrow, or even today, just a few hours, minutes, or seconds later, you have to live every moment to the best of your ability. He said while looking at the students in the front row. 
this is the same for everyone. This applies not just to heroes like soldiers or firefighters who risk their lives, but to you as well. People die when they slip on the floor and hit their head on the bathtub while taking a shower. He might get sick while eating his favorite fish or shellfish, or get hit by a falling flower pot, or he might experience a sudden mana surge. The student's mood became slightly solemn after hearing the principal's words. Like this, people cannot know when they will die. That's why you have to live your life to the best of your ability every moment. Students, even during the upcoming vacation period, do not forget the importance of life and time, and live a life without regrets even if you die tomorrow, or even right now. At that time. Sigh. A small sound rang out. The sound of thin leather being torn and the soft things inside bursting. The sound was not very loud and the time it was heard was extremely short. However, it was enough to make Principal Winston's long speech and all the audience in the auditorium who were listening to it stop breathing for a moment. Big. Dark red blood bursts from Principal Winston's mouth. Something came out from behind the stage curtain and shot through Principal Winston's back and through his heart. Knife? No, it's too long for that. So a window? No, it's too mushy to say that. Long and wriggling like a snake. Push. It was a single whip that spewed out blood from Winston's chest and back. Episode 300, The Era of Warmongers, 2. Push. A single whip pierced Principal Winston's heart. Cluck cluck. At the same time, laughter broke out loud enough to fill the auditorium. An impressive woman wearing shiny black tights and high heels walked out, lifting the curtain behind the stage. Ms. Uroboros. There is no need to explain that the whip that took Winston's life in an instant was hers. The moment she appeared, people in the hall momentarily tilted their heads. That's because this was her first time appearing in public. However, Miss Uroboros did not give the public time to adjust to reality. Ah, uh, ugh, uh, ugh. Uh. Winston. He collapsed on the stage and waved his arms. Who would have thought that an outstanding swordsman, as much as a sword master, would become like this in an instant, in front of everyone? And. Quasic. Miss Uroboros trampled Winston's body once more with the heels of her long heels. A perfect confirmed kill. Winston's heart exploded and he died on the spot. Landing. The winter sword Orwell, which was the season of his explanation, a famous sword that looks like the horn of a unicorn, falls to the floor and rolls. Ah, I finally got it. Key, dot. Miss Uroboros muttering to herself as she picked up Orwell broke the silence. Kaya. Only then do you hear a scream. Students, parents, and professors in the audience screamed all at once. And facing all this chaos head on, Miss Uroboros took off the mask covering her face. Professor Banshee, who was in the front row after giving his speech, s eyes widened as if they were torn apart. S. Professor Suddy. Yes. A rare villain who has caused an uproar throughout the Imperial capital. A vicious person who committed numerous crimes. His identity was none other than Professor Donatien Alphonse Francois Sadie de Sade, the troublemaker of the Academy. Ho ho ho, ah, this taste kills people. Suddy burst into laughter at the unrest taking place around him. Then Professor Banshee shouted as if he was astonished. I'm finally going crazy. You put a knife in the back of the benefactor who saved your life and raised you. Principal Winston, who raised and supported Suddy until now. But Suddy killed him. His favor was repaid with vengeance. The principal's professors unusually took Banshee's side and began to get angry. How could you do that to Winston, who raised you four innocent years from the time they were babies? You beast. If it weren't for you, Winston, you would have already been ruined. You ungrateful bitch. There really is no such thing as a devil. It's the same thing you're doing with your spare money. After all, you can't fool blood. However. Ah, it's quacking. It's not like we came to the duck farm. Professor Suddy picks his ear with one hand. And with his other hand, he moved the whip ever so slightly. However, that slight amount of kinetic power is amplified to a tremendous amount by the time it reaches the tip of the whip. 
the physical force delivered by the tip of the whip devastated the ground near where the professors were standing under the podium. Cock. Swordsmen and wizards who had reached quite high levels were thrown out. Everyone paid attention to the aura on the tip of Professor Suddy's whip. Liquid aura. Wow, in terms of density, it's the best graduate. The good thing is that she hasn't reached master level yet. But isn't that bitch's weapon a whip? Everyone stops when they see the whip in Suddy's hand. In fact, things like whips, bows, and chain scythes are quite irregular even among cold weapons. This type of weapon, if handled well, can raise the level of inaction to the next level. For example, a whip is a deformed weapon that even if a small amount of force is applied to the handle, the movement is doubled as the force passes near the long body, ultimately creating an enormous destructive force at the tip of the whip. Graduator's highest level aura starts from the handle of the whip and increases exponentially towards the end, creating a power almost comparable to that of the sword master. Of course, since you gain great power, you also have to take risks. Because the whip easily loses control at the slightest change, it sometimes attacks its owner's body. Well, wasn't Professor Suddy originally a master of the whip? Um. I actually have no experience dealing with a whip. The whip's abnormal aura explosion structure, and the unexpectedness of the unique weapon. Regardless of Mui's level, I think the danger level of that bitch should be raised to sword master level. The professors around me are buzzing. At that time. Professor Banshee stepped forward. Are you crazy, Suddy? There are numerous professors, students, and parents here. What can you do alone? I can't help but think that he did this because he wanted to die. Suyup no land. I told you not to call my name, right? Suddy cut Professor Banshee off. Certainly, at this academy, there are many elite students who are stronger than most adult knights or wizards, as well as outstanding professors and parents who taught and raised such elite students. Although it is called a school, it is actually an institution that reveres the extreme spirit of martial arts. There is a solid bureaucratic structure that is divided into grades and classes. In terms of strength and system alone, it is no different from a solid military group. But Professor Suddy was still smiling leisurely. Ho ho ho, when did I ever say I came alone? Everyone who heard those words had doubts and anxiety on their faces. Right at that moment. Quack 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 quack. A huge explosion of sound echoes throughout the auditorium. It was an impact from a magic wall far away. Soon, several scary faces began to appear through the windows of the auditorium. A large man with a scary look, a beautiful woman radiating decadence, a wrinkly old man, a child with an evil smile, etc. They were all different ages, genders, and physiques, but they had two things in common. First, they are all heinous criminals being pursued by the Empire. Second, they are all people who escaped from the wanted list and disappeared. For a moment, a shiver ran down Professor Banshee's spine. I heard that the rate of criminal arrests in the Imperial capital has dropped significantly recently. Could it be that the reason is? If you look at the faces of the criminals who entered this auditorium, they are all people whose investigations have been closed due to disappearance. Jack the Ripper, the Wolf of Gavadin, Tiger Chumphavat, the Bachelor of Powell Street, Son of Sam, Serial Killer Clown, Fashionista, Devil of Lorelei, Dissection of a Frog, Now, Hillside Strangler, Murderer on Green River, Bloody Mary, etc. All the vicious villains that the Imperial Guard was unable to apprehend are gathered here. And shockingly, they were all looking at Suddy in the center of the stage, full of respect, affection, and fear. Ah, Queen. I broke the magic wall as you asked. Now please bother me some more. Please hit me with the whip, step on me with your heel, Sister Dash. Regardless of age or gender, the eyes are filled with sticky hearts. It looks like he was brainwashed and trained quite strongly mentally and physically by Suddy. Suddy smiled brightly at those villains and gave orders. Every. Explode. Then the villains answered in unison. Yes, Queen. At the same time, all the villains started holding their breath. They unleashed all the mana in their bodies at once, and of course the result was a runaway mana and a huge explosion. Quack 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 quack. The main auditorium collapses with a violent explosion. 
Sudi was laughing amidst a shower of rebar and rubble. Banshee used shield magic to clear away the falling debris. And then he asked as if it was still absurd. Why on earth are you doing this? Have you really gone crazy? It was a question aimed at understanding the psychology of a criminal named Sudi and at the same time buying time until reinforcements arrived. Of course, Sudi also knew Professor Banshee's intentions, but she mostly went along cheerfully. It's not me that's crazy, it's the world. What? I have waited patiently all this time to sound the alarm in this crazy world. What are you waiting for? This moment. To be more precise, I hope the principal returns, and I hope the principal brings the parents together. Wouldn't that help my message be conveyed a little better? Then Professor Banshee's eyes narrowed. He spoke in a cold voice. Is it because of the 47-person unrest? At those words, Sudi smiled and nodded. Did you know? Your information power is amazing, not Tang. Professor Sudi continued speaking again. Her eyes were focused on the students behind her. You idiots at the academy probably understand that incident as nothing more than a coup d'etat by fools blinded by power. But the reality is very different. Her words briefly reminded the students of a presentation made by an honor student in a previous class. The 47 people unrest is an unprecedented event that occurred 35 years ago, not long after the empire was unified. It was a situation led by 47 people, but each of them was the head of one family, so it was called the 47 family unrest. A treason incident in which 47 people staged a coup, massacred numerous people, and even invaded the imperial palace. As a result, 46 out of 47 people were summarily executed on the spot, and the one who survived is currently imprisoned in the Nouvelle Vague prison in a remote part of the continent. The purpose of their coup is still unknown, but it is generally assumed that they aimed to usurp the throne. But Sudi waved his index finger. The reason why 47 people, including my grandfather, staged a coup was because they had nostalgia for the old times. Perfume. Okay. An era of self-respect where strength is truth and only the strong survived. Sudi's eyes began to sparkle with madness. It's the warring states period. Everyone, including Professor Banshee, swallowed their silence at her words. Before the unification of the empire, there was not a single day on the continent that was not noisy due to wars between countless countries. There are hundreds of people who each call themselves kings. An era of extinction, when several countries were created and disappeared every day. Isn't the logic of the warring states period that weak countries fall and strong countries rise? At that time, the strong man was the law and justice. It was a virtue, and it was an honor, to develop strength and repay something that had been done to you. Plural. Private sanctions. A world where all of this happened based on the logic of power. However, this situation has changed a lot since the continent was unified. There is no need for force in times of peace. To fill the void, laws were reorganized and a bureaucracy was created. Even if you are weak, if you are smart, you can pass various tests and rise to a high office, standing above those who are stronger than you. Large-scale wars disappeared and revenge and personal sanctions were considered dangerous. At one point, even the abolition of swords or abolition of mana orders was seriously considered. Peace turns men into pigs. A being no different from livestock. Aren't humans the lord of all things created to become strong and fight and win? However, in this world, there are many cases where things that do not deserve to be human dare to wear human masks. Professor Sudi shouted with his eyes shining. Professor Banshee asked in a calm voice. I understand everything. Why did you kill Principal Winston? Principal Winston was a long-legged uncle who had supported Sudi since she was a child. When Sudi's grandfather, the Marquis de Sade, was imprisoned in the Nouvelle Vague prison for the 47 riots, he was the one who prevented his granddaughter from being punished by association, saying it was unfair. Professor Banshee criticized sharply. Is this the only way to repay you for pitying the girl who lost her entire family overnight and was left alone? But Sudi snorted. It was this man, Winston, who caught my grandfather and threw him in. It was during the battle with my grandfather that this guy suffered internal injuries due to mana overflow. Did you think I didn't know? 
a very disgusting guy. And anyway, since this guy was a symbol of the school, I had to kill him. Sudi shrugged. The academy is a means to incorporate martial arts into the system. It is a tactic of those in power to suppress and subjugate the power of warriors by cleverly packaging it with words of success. It is literally a symbol of oppression. Those who use swords and magic should be able to grow in strength by fighting on the battlefield and further build a family and found a nation. There's nothing you can do here except wait for the fleshy bones to be thrown at you. Then should we praise personal revenge as an honor and risk our lives over the slightest conflict? So how do powerless ordinary people live? It's not some barbaric society. What do you know? Why should the powerful take into account the circumstances of the powerless? Why do powerless people always whine because they want to get something for free? If you think about it that way, why don't you whine about monsters or natural disasters? Simply because we are the same human beings, of the same race. Through words and conversation. Are you being rude to strangers just for that reason? Do you whine to people you can communicate with, and lie down on people you can't communicate with? What kind of cowardly and foolish logic is this? Suddy gritted his teeth and growled. Then I will become your natural disaster. Don't you dare even feel like whining. Just accept it, pigs. When Suddy swings the whip, another storm of aura comes. In addition, the number of criminals coming through the cracks in the main auditorium was increasing. Sister. Love you. Look here. Queen Suddy. I am willing to sacrifice my body for you. Gulp gulp gulp. Considering that he had secretly arrested and kidnapped so many criminals and trained them as perfect slaves, Suddy's abilities were clearly real. Right then. Damn it. The head of a famous criminal who was running to the front suddenly fell and rolled on the floor. Damn it. Clunk clawed. Soak. And then, one after another, the necks run away. The ranks of criminals are collapsing. The nightmares that once filled the entire empire with fear are dying out all too easily. It was a sight that even the study of the world could not help but harden. Yet. Fluttering. Black blood is fluttering in the wind. Dark black hair, eyes as bright as blood. A man with a dark red aura rising from the tip of his sword was blocking numerous warmongers.